Got the Eagles game soon. Yeah, hurry up. We're, we're oh, that that. that's going to be such an exciting game. <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> Who dat? Who dat? Just let us enjoy being in the basement. So this is a funny story, and people yeah, are joining. But... Are winning. <laughs> so I'm going to um, I'm going to be going home to New Orleans, uh, and the weekend that I'm going to be there is the weekend that the Eagles play the Saints. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sean's like, I'm not going. I changed my mind. How is that funny? The Eagles are going to get their their butts beat. Well, the... funny for me. After these people are going to be upset. <laughs> Well, I don't care about them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it gives you a reason that. to throw Talking something. smack. Talk, yeah, we'll see. I know. Watch you guys blast us that one. It's not going to happen. Trust me. Probably not. Yeah, but how about them Dodgers, guys? Come on. Ooh. World Series. L.A. Dodgers. Come on. <laughs> that's that's a Brian. Uh, that's a. Well, it's, it's, it's one one right now. With, rooting for L.A. I just got well, Dr. Dr. Hoffman. It's good to see you. How are you? It does look like the room has stopped uh, increasing no in candy. size. So. No candy anymore. I know it's a real letdown. I was going to try to figure something out with Mr. Garten, but. Well, you know, maybe I should just FedEx it to you. You can talk to Zach. He's really good I've about been, sending. I've been eating pretzels. <laughs> All right, shall we go ahead and get started then? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our board meeting this evening. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started this meeting, but prior to this meeting, we did have an executive session to speak about a legal matter. I believe it was not much more than a legal matter, right? Am I correct on that, Dr. Harner? Personnel matters, legal matters. Personnel matters, five different legal matters. Thank you. So we will start the meeting with our flag salute. Joe, if you want to get us started with that. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation under, under God, God in the visible with liberty and justice. justice. All right, we're going to move on to our roll call. Terry, if you want to get us going with that. Terry, Terry's running the meeting, right? Not tonight, next time. Oh, I was going to Anita! <laughs> You're still here. I'm still here. Uh, oh. Mr. Kern. Here. Mr. Akmanowitz. Here. Ms. Weed. Here. Mrs. Mitchell. Here. Mr. Micucci. Here. Mr. Reimers. Here. Mr. Spear. Here. Mr. Klein. Here. And Mr. Jackson. Here. All right, our announcements this evening. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. I'm going to move on to our approval of the minutes. I'll need a motion to approve the minutes of the October 8th meeting. So I'll moved. Move. Mr. Klein. Did you get that, Anita? I don't know if I did. Mr. I got Klein Mr. made the Klein. motion. Mr. Mr. Reimer seconded. Reimer seconded. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, discussion. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That motion carries unanimously. We have our first general public comment here, and I believe we had a few submissions of those. Terry, if you'd like to go ahead and start reading them out. Sure. Uh, the first public comment that I'm going to read is from uh, the Quaker Town School District Nursing Department. Uh, members of the board, the nursing department of QCSD is very thankful for your attention to the health and safety of our students and staff. The current quarantine guidance of our health and safety plan has been effective in keeping our COVID-19 cases low 
and our school community relatively healthy. We are also pleased to report that our PPE supply is now at adequate levels. The majority of elementary nurses are reporting an increase in visits due to students attending school and playgrounds uh, as now in use. With an increase of students in attendance, social distance, distancing has become more difficult. This is particularly seen in the amount of children in the hallways and changing some of the logistics of lunching in the classrooms to maintain six foot distancing while masks are, no, are off for longer than 15 minutes. The middle and high schools are continuing to see low numbers of visits as they follow the hybrid schedule for another three weeks before returning to a five day live schedule. The visits that are being encountered is for seasonal allergy, allergies and colds, and this is true at all levels. The cold allergy flu season is upon us and it is becoming increasingly more difficult triaging the information necessary to keep our children in school. The symptoms are all shared with COVID symptomology and we will continue to err on the side of caution. At this point, a majority of families are cooperative and understanding of the precautions taken to keep our community safe. We request parents when calling their student out ill to list their symptoms and expect a call from the nurse for guidance. As your healthcare professionals, we are working diligently to triage and communicate with families, all the while managing our health rooms. Due to COVID, we are working outside of our scheduled hours. Nurses are working before school hours to field staff, parent emails, and phone messages as to whether they should attend school for that day. This is an important step in adherence of the health and safety policy. The level of attention necessarily, necessary to thoroughly investigate and answer each individual circumstance, complete the nursing documentation, and notify the appropriate school staff members each day is daunting and quickly becoming unsustainable. We are working weekends, answering staff and parent emails and triaging phone calls, which is affecting our family life. The stress is the major, is the major undertaking is causing sleepless nights and anxiety as we fulfill our duties to, best of, to the best of our abilities. One solution to help with this burden is to have a full-time floating nurse. Currently staffing has not been a major problem in the nursing department. We have hired many new substitute nurses thanks to the increased pay rate, which was approved for nursing substitutes. We are concerned about the possibility of nurses or their families becoming sick and thus leading to lengthy absences, which could impact the health and safety of our school community. Substitute nurses focus on seeing the students who present with, in, who are present with injuries and illnesses throughout the school day but a floating nurse could more easily step in and handle COVID response, screenings, and state mandates, such as immunization, physical, and dental compliance. We cannot ignore the increasing numbers, both nationally and internationally. We have observed people becoming COVID weary and complacent when in our professional and scientific based opinion, that measures for social distancing, wearing masks and washing hands continues to be an important migrating factor. We are facing the start of the holiday season with the family gatherings, and this is an area of concern to be particularly mindful and vigilant. We once again thank you for your support and attention to helping us provide a safe environment for students and staff alike. Thank you, Quakerton Community School District Nursing Department. The next public comment is from Ryan Wynn, uh, QCEA president. I'd be remiss if I didn't start by thanking all of our members, support staff, bus drivers, students, and parents for your continued support and grace during these unprecedented times. To the members of QCEA especially, thank you for continuing to do what you do every day in the face of the most challenging working conditions teachers have ever faced. Members of the board, please slow down your plan to continue to pack our buildings with students. Your push to get our students back in our buildings as fast as possible for whatever your motives are is significantly diminishing the quality of education in Quakertown by demanding the impossible from the people who deliver it. As I'm sure you have seen, the number of COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths continue to rise across our country and state. Instead of comparing us to other countries like Sweden, who have managed and contained the virus more effectively than the United States, we should focus on improving conditions in our own country, state, 
county and town. We shouldn't be waiting until it's too late for cases to rise again, but should be proactive instead. When recently quoted in the Bucks County Courier Times about in-school COVID spread, Dr. Damascus stated, we do believe at some point it will happen, but the health and safety plans are strong enough to prevent major outbreaks in schools. For once I find myself agreeing with Dr. Damasker, in-school outbreaks are going to happen and we should be extremely cautious in making sure they don't happen, no matter what, if they're subjectively major or not. Your plan to return secondary students to school five days a week floods a large number of students from grades six to 12 into crowded classrooms and hallways, all while not, all while not being able to maintain six foot social dis distancing. That decrease in social distance comes to on the heels of the CDC yesterday, proving how exposure times are even shorter, especially at shorter distances. Your plan creates hundreds of additional exposure opportunities for individual students and staff members each day. Your plan increases contacts with high touch areas and bathrooms by the thousands, while at the same time, you're decreasing the amount of time in half that the few maintenance workers have in each building to clean and sanitize those uh, throughout the day. Your plan does, not, uh, does nothing to prevent a major in-school out break from occurring, but instead increases the probability. As always, I, my fellow association members, and the rest of the staff of our district are more than willing to collaborate, provide input, and seek solutions. We ask that you join us. Each member we hear one of you say how you understand what we're going through and how you want the board and administration to work with teachers to help but time between board meetings continues to pass by and nobody reaches out. We often hear, what is the solution? When we bring up concerns and problems, my colleagues in the secondary level haven't been asked to brainstorm possible fixes, such as possibly maintaining the current block model instead of the seven period model or other creative block scheduling ideas. Ideas like these will decrease the traffic in the halls and the opportunities for contact spreading. They will also allow teachers to maintain a current model of teaching instead of continually switching how we need to implement delivering an education to our students. Why not survey the people who are putting your plans into effect and ask them how the plan is working, how they feel about returning five days a week and how they are feeling emotionally and physically. I hope you choose to contact me and the QCA membership to meet, listen, discuss, and discuss these and other possible solutions that would increase the safety of our staff and students. Otherwise, I fear the lack of care and understanding shown to the staff, those who literally run the district day in and day out, is going to result in losing so many more staff members due to leaves, resignations, and retirements. Your refusal to hear the pleas from your staff will make you responsible for putting children back in their homes full time to learn through a fully virtual education system because of the lack of teachers. On behalf of the Quakertown Community Education Association, Ryan Wayne, QCEA President. Uh, the next public comment is from Catherine Infante from Milford Township. I am a teacher in the district. With your promise to revisit the plan, each board meeting, I implore you to, re to review the guidelines. Sorry. Um, um, sorry about that. Um, the guidelines that expand the definition of who is in close contact. As we move away from the hybrid model and have more students in the classroom and hallways causing us to be closer than six feet, this is a serious concern. These new guidelines significantly impact schools. Please take into consideration the many short and long-term health effects post-COVID infection. Our scientists are discovering that it is not just the lungs affected, but many organs. An example being damage to the heart, not limited to older and middle-aged adults, but also young adults. Next comment is from Kevin Kelly. He's also a staff member. As a psychologist, teachers share with me that this situation is taking a toll on their mental and physical health. Exhaustion is a theme as the teachers feel that their energy, attention, and time are divided with no one getting full attention. The weight of working day and evening with no boundaries between work and home is significant. 
Time during the day is limited with multiple non-teaching obligations. They also have concerns about the school following all recommended health and safety protocols. My recommendation to help teachers is first to absolutely take the health and safety plan seriously so teachers can be secure in their physical health. Secondly, to listen to them and take their feedback and to make sure they are heard. Third, to, to take less important things off their plate so they can concentrate on their students and focus on teaching. Finally, approaching this situation with empathy, flexibility, and humility would be very helpful in these challenging times. Um, the next public comment is from Sandy Hipoff. Um, she is from Richland Township. Thank you for the teachers who are doing a great job with the impossible uh, tasks that they are being dealt with. Your dedication has not gone unnoticed and it, it is appreciated. On another note, I would like to express my concern of how public comments are being shared. By choosing to read only certain public comments, the board is censoring and even silencing many voices. It is disappointing that comments are read by a third party. Um, I'm sorry. It is disappointing that the comments are read by a third party who cannot convey the same tone inflection that the author intended. I recognize these meetings need to be held in a webinar format but the board can invite individuals who wish to make a statement to be a panelist for the brief period of time. We are in unique times and everyone has a right to have their voice heard, even if it means that the meeting runs long. Cutting off comments just because the board members are tired is not a valid excuse to censor the public and resorting to publishing the unread comments on the board docs does not make up for this avoidance. Next comment is from Megan McClaskey from Quakertown Borough. I would like to thank whoever looked into the students being allowed at all sporting events. Though it was disappointing that my daughter was not allowed to attend senior night for her friend when she had a ticket. I appreciate that students are now given an opportunity to be part of the raffle for all sports. And that's the end of the public comment at this time. Thank you, Terry. Um, in regards to the last comment, I I think I did ask Dr. Harner and he's gonna be following up, but I believe that the board agreed to allow anyone with a ticket, not necessarily blood relative to attend. So I, I think that we're gonna be following up on that. I appreciate all of the feedback and the comments. I think at some point we may wanna look, we're trying to figure out a way for us to get back into a building structure uh, that would be nice. Um, from a technology aspect, it's something we're still working through. I do think at some point we can also consider changing the way that we do our public comment. I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to that. I think that we'd have to be, I think a lot of other districts do it that way. So I'm not opposed to that. Really appreciate, you know, the comments about how hard our teachers are working. We know that they're working uh, really hard and our administration is, is attempting in so many ways to try and provide support so teachers can focus on what is important and that is our kids. And I do, do want to note that while we have had cases in our schools, we've had no community spread within our schools. And I will say that each meeting that our success is not defined by the cases that we that come from outside of our schools. We know through contact tracing, I believe it was last time I checked, only about 14% of all of the cases are occurring through community spread. Majority of cases that are being spread within Bucks County, and I would venture to say within the country, are happening within close contact of friends, family, parties, things where people are not masking, um, distancing, taking precautions. So, um, so it's, it's to be clear, we're we're not seeing that community spread in our schools, and that's something that we should celebrate. We know that nothing is. Um, definite. And, and we certainly could see that situation in, uh, where there could be spread within the schools. We hope that we don't see that. And if we do, we'll take action at that time. So um, what's Mitchell, that? Can I, I just want to say one quick thing Please about the thank you to the nurses for providing that, that um, information. I don't want a solution, but the, I wonder if like some of the triaging of emails and things like that, if that's a huge thing, I wonder if maybe somebody else can help them do 
do the ones that are easy to answer, easy to, I don't know, but it's, it's, it's just maybe there's some way that short of another nurse, maybe there's somebody else that can help them, you know, sift through the administration tasks. Work. Yeah. Right. I'm glad that you mentioned that because the, for my first reaction was when the nurses came to ask was let's give them another nurse. Um, and maybe that's just my gut and it's not, I'm not digging deep enough to into it. And of course I'm only one board member, but in, in a pandemic, particularly, I think nurses are such a critical aspect of what we're doing, but John, that's a great point that I don't know if there's a way that we can take away some of those administrative responsibilities so they can focus on what matters one way or another, they're telling us that they don't have what they need. Well, so, so there's a, there, there, there could be a solution to this, which is, you know, sort of a, um, a, a model in which you, you upstaff when you need it and you can not, and so I, I, maybe the administration can look at like this sort of a flex type of thing where we, we bring on another substitute for a week or two as, 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 you know, we're finding more and more work go on as opposed to just straight up hiring somebody. I mean, I, not opposed to it, but I, and I understand what they're saying. I just, you know, is there other staffing models that you can do in the short term uh, while we evaluate it? I mean, so if, if your average number of nurses is, I don't know, 10 and you know, maybe for two weeks, you know, increasing it to 11 to, to help with that. Not a bad suggestion, Dr. Harner. Any, any thoughts on how we can some kind of way um, root cause analysis for this or maybe try something different? I'd like to share some insight to have Janet Pallone share some insight. She supervises the nursing function across the district. So Janet, would you share some of your wisdom? Or not a problem. I think if we go back to the comment that the nurses said, which is right now we're staffed appropriately. Um, I do understand that they have some work outside of the school day of which they are being compensated for when it goes above and beyond on the essential duties of their job, just like teachers have lesson plans to write and parents to call as well. So we have met with them and, and did extend that uh, to them for when it happens on weekends, where it's above, like I said, above and beyond the essential components of their job. We also, um, as they noted in their um, comment that we've hired more uh, sub nurses, thanks to your increase in uh, the salary for our sub nurses. So thanks again for that. I do have another interview coming up next week. So hopefully we'll have another one on the books. And um, we also, every day that a sub nurse is available, knowing the strain that's happening in our buildings, we do have uh, any sub nurse that's available come in, even if there isn't an absence. So I think that's why at this point we're staffed pretty well. Um, so, and we'll continue to do that, continue to add on uh, sub nurses as we move along and hopefully that we'll, we'll stay at this level where um, we're not short staffed and there's not an office that doesn't have a nurse. So is your recommendation that we keep things the way they are? I think at this point, yes. The one thing to consider would be just like buildings have a building sub. If we were to have like a building daily report sub, if we were to have a nursing department daily report sub, someone that we hire um, and it could be one of our, our sub nurses who's um, in fulfilling that same role so that five days a week we're guaranteed at least one person. Um, but at, at this point, I think we're okay, but looking to cold and flu season coming up, we might potentially need that. Yeah, and also with the return of the secondary students, I think we may see um, an increased need. I would just ask, um, I trust your judgment. I would just ask that you maybe coordinate with the nurses to try and see what we can do to help them. And I know you're doing that all the time, but just so they feel like they're heard, um, you know, what, what kind of solutions can we work together to try and uh, tackle this? Sure. Our, our nursing coordinator um, from last year or last several years had retired. We do have two nursing coordinators, uh, Michelle Molyneux and Melissa Kelly, who are awesome as well. And I do communicate with them frequently. So um, and they do keep a chart, which I have access to as far as um, building coverage and when they need to move potential nurses around. But as I, I said, there has not been a building without nursing coverage, which is rare, honestly, at this point in time in the year. That has happened uh, in years past 
at this time. Thank you. And uh, to, to that same, down that same route, um, what the teachers, uh, what Dr. Kelly and um, Mr. Wien had, had asked for again um, was sort of a, a way to communicate so their voices were felt and heard as well. And I know I had mentioned this at the last meeting too, and, and I still feel like I think that this could even apply with the nurses as well, that if we had a committee that reported to the board at every meeting just for like a health and safety committee, but you know, for this coronavirus, for these times, that way the teachers' voices would be heard. And, and I do know from the emails they have sent, we have gotten some good ideas before about what they see in their classrooms that sometimes may help shape our, our you know, week or, or our board or our reviews of our health and safety plan every time we have a board meeting. So I would again ask that, that we could possibly put together this committee, you know, like I said, a few board members, a few administrators, teachers from, from each building, grade level, even just elementary and secondary for now and see how it goes. And, and a representative from the nurse's office even too. I don't think it's a bad idea. I think that, you know, the, the better the flow of information right now, I mean, I'm sure there's probably something like that already in place. So I'll there defer. Is, there is. I, I, I talk with Mr. Wayne on a regular basis. Um, um, and he hears from me, I hear from him. I see Doc Kelly um, down. I walk down the guidance hallway and talk to Doc Kelly, and, and I always ask him, "What are you thinking?" And um, and everywhere I go, I ask folks, "What can we do for them?" And um, there's some things that we disagree on, um, but there's an awful lot that we agree on. And, and if it's something that we can do right away, we do it. Um, so I I think it it is just having a committee to to meet, um, but they they we're engaged all the time all the time i guess th the only reason i say this is because you know this is now the second board meeting in a row that we get an email from ryan we and that said their voices aren't being heard their concerns aren't being addressed i think well, i think part of that well that's part of it's your the decision making of the board and that, that, that about going live five days a week um not having wednesdays um, there's decisions that the board has made and we're implementing those decisions as an administration. So I think that's, that's part of it. Um, and, and, you know, last meeting we had a discussion about the instructional model uh, that was a, that was an administration thing. So there are disagreements, um, but being heard um, is definitely something that we do our best to do. And we do that at the building levels and we do it here at the office. And, and I, I commend Ryan, Ryan's leadership and um, has been phenomenal for the last six months, seven months, um, working with the administration, working with principals um, as we went um, working from home for, six, uh, for the end of the, the last year and, and reopening plans, they were part of the, our discussions. Again, they're, they don't agree with everything, but they agree with most. You know, but one of the discussions I know Ms. Mitchell wanted to talk about tonight was about um, um, live streaming. And, you know, that was a discussion, the way we've done it and not required it was came from a, dis a professional informal discussion with Ryan and as a union leader about uh, making demands on teachers and things like that. So it, that was negotiated out the way it was. And um, so I think we, we have those systems in place already, and I'm grateful for their leadership. But I think there's one piece missing, is if the disconnect in the communication is coming between the board's decisions and the teachers, then maybe the board should be, at least representatives from the board should be part of any of these formal or informal meetings that you're having. Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, here's the thing too. Let's remember that the teachers union it's representing, sure, they're representing the union, but they're not necessarily representing all teachers' opinions. So, and I, I feel for them. I feel for everyone in this situation. We're all giving a lot more. We're all experiencing stress. Teachers aren't the only ones, unfortunately, that are experiencing mental health issues. Children are experiencing it. 
parents are experiencing it. We're all having to step up and do a little bit more. And that's going to be stressful um, for us. And I do want I do want to talk a little bit later, maybe in my um, president's report, we can discuss the whole live streaming thing because um, I think that's important that we have some consistency around it. And I don't know that we have had some consistency consistency around that. All right, I'm gonna move along. Um, thank you for everyone's feedback. I am, instead of moving on to the superintendent's report, I'm gonna change our agenda up just a little bit. So please bear with me here. And we discussed in um, the finance committee meeting and we've discussed this in previous board meetings, the changes to the articles of agreement for the tech school. And Mr. Kern, I know that you put together a little something um, and we, you know, if you could just quickly go through, give us a, a, an overview of this, this doesn't have to be a vote tonight. It can be, um, Palisades happened to vote on this last night and they did have some concerns and they voted against it in, in all three sending districts have to, they're required, um, to vote on this unanimously. However, if the board thinks that it's a good idea for us to vote just so we can get a sense of where everyone stands on this, at least having a discussion about it is, is important. Sure. I had uh, just kind of run through it quickly and I'll, I'll do it from the point of view of, it's really, there's, there's a few things involved. It's a funding formula, which is the primary thing, but from Quakertown's point of view, the nutritional services is another aspect. There's a bit about the superintendent's term and the process just in short is each sending district has to have a majority approve it. So Penridge approved it. Palisades already did not approve it. They had some good points about some things. Um, so it's a little bit of a slow way to, to kind of get progress through there. But from a from an enrollment point of view, you can kind of get the picture pretty clearly from the uh, pie chart there. And the funding formula has been in place for a while. And I'll just quickly say that there's, <clears throat> there's in originally, well, currently, there's an operating formula. That's the, the typical one uh, that most of the funding comes from. And there was something put in place decades ago for capital projects. Uh, and it's based on market value. And the idea was that maybe Palisades is wealthier than Quaker Town. So their market value, their percentages might be different than their enrollment percentages. So the proposed idea that, that folks were floating was, what if we just simplified it? It's, it's not a huge difference anyway. And it, it is simpler if you think about, let's just prorate the budget across the sending districts uh, number of students they send. So, and you might wonder what the uh, kind of the pros and cons are, but the two formulas, you could construe that as unnecessarily complicated versus a simple single formula. And, you know, I had some concerns about just blindly, so to speak, you know, are there any breaks? Either formula, you know, it still just says whatever the tech school puts forth, we get to, to divvy it up amongst the sending district. So the one thing I I feel comfortable about is the boards approve the annual budget so that can act as a break. So I'm not so worried about putting a break into the, the funding formula per se. And just to look across, there. The proposal was a five-year rolling average. For all intents and purposes, that dampens out, that dampens out the yearly fluctuations. Although you can see Palisades has been very consistent. So there really isn't any fluctuations. And Penridge has been climbing steadily over time and the Quakertown enrollment has been dipping. So that just gives you a feel for over time, what would that funding formula have looked like in terms of the percentages. So it's, uh, if anything, Penridge is gonna start to, you know, they passed Quakertown, for example. So Penridge is, will, will end up having um, more a larger percentage uh, as their student enrollment continues to go higher than Quakertown. 
And then there was a bit about the nutritional funding. Ev evidently, Quaker Town was just happily paying for food at the same rate as our, our enrollment, so to speak, except we didn't use any. I think we had five people eat out of the hundreds. So, so it's, it's a bit, I think it was probably just left in there for simplicity, but if we lump that into the the, the articles of amendment saying similar to basic prorated sharing of the budget, the same thing should happen to the nutritional aspect that we should, you know, each, each district should pay the basic number of students that take advantage of it, so to speak. And then there was a bit about the, oh, that's a new, that's just putting math to the, to the percentages. I, I think it's, like as an example, it, it shows we would we paid an extra eleven thousand dollars just because we're nice, um, but that that would be one of the things. And then if I go to the the last bit, which is there's good pros and cons on both sides. But the superintendent rotates every four years. Some people, uh, I mean, every two years. the The idea was if you shorten the term, I'll just go to the if if someone serves for two years and then it goes to the next district, which is another two years, and the next district, which is another two years, in theory, you know, Quaker Town wouldn't wouldn't come back for for a four year period, and a lot has changed in that in that time. So some folks were thinking, should it be more frequent change to try to kind of stir stir things up and keep 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 everybody not quite so far away from what's going on. So that was the proposal for one year. Palisades felt that was too long, that there's, you know, you, especially it might be hard to understand if, if you don't, if you don't live and breathe work, working in a school district, that a year can go by pretty fast if you're trying to do some major initiatives, trying to change some things. You know, I, I can see their point where as a superintendent, you might have some initiatives and you blink and the year's up. So, so I think that that particular aspect we may need to revisit that. Uh, it looked like Palisades was not as happy with that idea. And the other element was, was to sort of split the, whoever's in the superintendent seat, if it's Quaker Town or Palisades, the chair should be from one of the other districts. So it shouldn't be, shouldn't be um, the same district having kind of both, both seats of power, if you want to think of it that way. So, that, so that, that's the basics. Um, and this is just, yeah, you got to vote. So, but that was the idea. That's the funding formula, switch it to instead of part of it just being uh, prorated based on enrollment, everything would be prorated based on enrollment going forward. The nutritional thing, that would also be based on usage, uh, not enrollment. So that would be uh, a, kind of a plus in Quaker Town's favor. And then the term, the term limits were decided to go from two years to one. So that's what's that's what the amendment's about. Any questions? I, I would just have one for uh, Dr. Harner. Uh, being a superintendent and one that has worked with the JOC in the past, would you recommend the one year rotation? I, I mean, would you want to get back into tech school sooner than four years, every four years? Would be the question I would ask you. Uh, uh, it's two, ask that two of, years okay. now, right? Two. Well, no, no. It, yeah, if it were to pass, but yeah, I would ask Dr. Harner if if he would if he would um, endorse the change if it were to have gone through. Don't forget to unmute. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, I think it. This is a conversation that's, that the board needs to decide. Um, I think there's the, the concern uh, that was articulated by John, Mr. Kern, John, about a, uh, having a superintendent from a different district. And there are the concerns during my tenure, that was a concern. And um, over the last previous two academic years, um, I think uh, if, if that's a concern for you or for the for the board, then then make the change. If not, um, then it, it keeps me out of the loop for four straight years as a 
uh, a superintendent that goes out there on a regular basis. My first couple of years, you know, I was here and getting worried about getting the systems in place that that I was asked to do by the board, and and we did that. So when my turn came up, um, I spent a lot of time out there. As you know, their their finances were messed up. Their their um, we were hiring a new superintendent, bringing him on board. We had personnel issues there, um, serious personnel issues, um, and 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 so we we got to those things. But I I had been four years not affiliated, not under, not a part of what's going on day to day out there. So there is some strength to that being in there and rotating every third year. Um, but it's I, I truly believe it's a board it's a board comfort zone. Um. As a superintendent, to do the best job you can, do you think you could have done it in one year or did you need two years? Well, I, I believe where what we did in the two years, we moved mountains and I feel very good about where the tech school is. About the only thing that was not, um, that I still feel um, that we don't have a total handle on is, is in the finances. Um, but everything else, I've you know, under personnel, we hired. That we have a whole new leadership team, uh, or at least people in different positions. The IU is now supervising the uh, finances out there. Um, they have a good curriculum. Um, we're working on expanding programs. Um, all three of the superintendents are engaged uh, in a monthly meeting. I mean, if not more. I'm going to interrupt you, and and I mean from a practical standpoint, I don't mean what you did specifically. I think we mean planning forward, looking at other superintendents who are in your position. Does it really require two years to do the best job or with, with it being one year on two years off, would that, is that more impractical or, or harder to juggle? I think it's, a, it's an engagement issue. So I would say that it doesn't matter if we're there for two years, three years, five years or one year. I think we, we, it, all the superintendents um, Dr. Bolton, uh, Dr. O'Connell and I would go in there and, and we put our resources there. I, I, the people on your screen here, Dr. Hoffman's been out there a zillion times in her role as one, since I was superintendent. Um, uh, and Zach's been out there. So I, I, sir, I don't, I don't think it, I'm going to give you the answer cool. you want. That's all right. I, I wanted a That's, straight answer, but you're not, you're, you're basically saying you're impartial. I'm in. I'm impartial because whoever is in, is a superintendent of record better do a darn good job. And but I feel I next in a better place. One of the reasons I had for for uh, advocating for this so strongly too is, uh, and I, I believe that it would um, spur better communication amongst the superintendents if they were changing over more frequently. They would have to work together on some of these projects that maybe they were in the middle of when they were switching from one to the other. So I, I think the tech school then becomes less two years, this is Dr. Harner's, two years, this is Dr. Bolton's, two years, this is Dr. O'Connell's. And now they're all merging together a lot more frequently. So they do have to work together. And it, it's really a more upper bucks cohesion of districts. That was I would hope, my opinion. I would hope that the uh, superintendents are not working independently of each other right now. I mean, Dr. Harner, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, even though you may be at one time the uh, current director at the, the uh, tech school, you're not running that without consulting the other two superintendents on most of your decisions. Am I correct? I, I was out there a, a lot during my two years. And every time I left after a visit, if there was something that that was going on that I believe the other superintendents need to know before I got back to our district office, I had called both superintendendents. And that did not happen in the four years that I was there uh, or the five, five and a half years before I got here or, or my first five and a half years or four and a half years. I understand. I'm just, I'm just saying, uh, you know, I would tr trust that the other superintendents would step up a little bit better and, keep communication so but i i don't think this the term of the superintendent is an issue i think clearly the ability to no longer pay part of the budget that we do not reap the benefit from that being the food budget 
is clearly a, a benefit to our school district. And as far as a funding formula, I just think it makes sense for the entire payment to the tech school to be under one funding mo uh, model rather than a couple different ones for different purposes. So frankly, I think we should vote to approve it tonight, but um, I'm not sure what anybody else wants to speak about. What? Someone could make a motion to vote on it. Yeah, I'll say too also that when, when it comes to the articles of agreement that you know, we're talking about something that is decades old, the system that's used now. And if nothing else, I think it needs to be updated. And like what Mr. Kern said in his presentation, you know, a lot of this is, is being simplified. Um, and I've looked it over numerous times, and, and I think overall it's a fair system. And I think it's fair moving forward for the next couple of decades. So... If there is a motion to vote on it tonight, um, I would certainly support it. Is there a way to revisit this this uh, uh, model every, you know, instead of decades, every couple of years, 10 years, maybe whatever? So well, we're not I'm, dealing with it more often? Uh, that, that would be the, the JOC would bring that to you when that was time. There is a committee at the JOC now that, that will be reviewing it where I don't believe there was one before. So does somebody want to put a motion on the table or do you guys want to poll the board or what do you want to do? I would like to make a motion. We might as well just vote I'll second that. It over with. Well, what's the motion, Chris? You didn't give me what the motion the is. The motion is to vote to approve from Quakertown the 11th Amendment of the JOC's Articles of Agreement. And, and I Dave, would second that. You Dave, so you're seconding it, right, Dave? There you go. All right, any other further discussion, questions? I just have one more. John, you oh, mentioned ahead, Brian. I, I had sorry. a question for I had a question for Zach on whether um, he had an opinion as far as any economic impact. Um, so, so we did do some analysis, and that came up in finance. Uh, I'm impartial to it as well. If there are major projects or renovation projects that come up in the future, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be required to pay a larger portion than we would under the current formula. But if, if that's what everybody votes on and agrees to, then, then, then I would say it's fair. Thank you. John, you mentioned that Palisades uh, voted against it. They had some reservations and, and maybe you or Chris could, could comment more specifically on what those reservations were. Yeah, I think they felt that the consistency of a superintendent for two years was valuable, which is why I think Chris was trying to get Dr. Harner's uh, or Dave was. Um, yeah, I think that was, from what I could tell, that was the, the biggest sticking point. And there was a little bit of nostalgia around um, having the, well, it's always been this way, but I still think it's such, it's not that big of a difference one way or the other. So just just make it one because uh, it's, it's not like Palisades is 47 times wealthier than Quaker Town and they pay this giant, right? It's even what Zach showed in the finances. We're not talking about earth shatteringly different numbers and just rather, you know, sim simplify it. If so we got quite a few comments that were why fix what isn't broken, but you know, that's sort of their opinion on what isn't broken too. Right. right. Yeah, we should were... never change anything because it's not broken. <laughs> well, things don't necessarily have to be broken, but I think they do need to be updated from time to time. You know, these articles were were done literally generations ago when everything was different. So I, I personally think it's long overdue. Yeah. One of the board members mentioned his dad created them and he asked him and he couldn't remember why. <laughs> I thought like that. that was interesting when he said that. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah. Like the oh, Constitution, Mr. Klein. Well, thank you all, everybody, for, uh, you know, working on this for so long, Chris. Uh, John, you know, I really appreciate your efforts. John, maybe not so directly. <laughs> no, no, Chris, you, your help on the committee. I just tried to rescue Megan from herself. I know she's on the phone, but I was, I was like, oh, you're going to make her mad. No, no I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Too many words, <laughs> right? Let, let's like, vote on this. Yeah. And we'll put all it right. Back. Uh, let's make it a roll call vote, if that's okay, Anita.
Mr. Klein. Yes. Mr. Jackson. Yes. Mr. Kern. Yes. Mr. Micucci. Yes. Mr. Akmanowitz. Yes. Ms. Weed. Yes. Mr. Reimers. Yes. Mr. Spear. Yes. Mrs. Mitchell. Yes. The motion unanimous. Motion passes. So just as just as a reminder, thank you all for voting on that. Um, so it's going to still have to be reworked, but I think it does send a message to Palisades where Quaker Town stands. It'll likely come back, but we had a good discussion. We got a chance to vote on it. So really appreciate everyone's conversation and vote on that. I'm going to move on to the superintendent's report and I'll turn it over to Dr. Horner. Thank you, ma'am. We'll try to get right through it. I don't think we have hopefully no motions from the from the, the board during our, our presentations. First up is uh, assistant principal at the high school, Jason Mag Magnich, who is going to be recognizing our students of the month. Hello, thank you everyone. Um, I want to start off and let you know that we had four great students be selected by their peers and their, their teachers. Ninth grade was Riley Mann. 10th grade was Angela Calavansi. Four, I'm sorry, our junior was Madeline Labange and our senior was Nick Simer. Um, our outstanding student of the month was Madeline Labange and unfortunately she could not be here this evening but she drafted a nice little article, I'm sorry, a little letter that I like to read for everyone tonight because she's currently at her varsity soccer game. Okay. Good evening, school board, administrators, teachers, and community members. Sadly, I'm unable to speak tonight due to an away varsity soccer game. Go Panthers. Nonetheless, I wanted to write this message to thank not only the Rotary Club for their amazing award, but also express my gratitude for being honored as the Outstanding Student of the Month. As we all well know, last year caught us off guard and presented us with many challenges never before faced. COVID-19 tried, tried each and every one of us. It tested me as a person as well as a student. Through this all, I realized that my education is truly a partnership and I am exceeding fortunate to have a strong support network. Despite the uncertainty with these unprecedented circumstances, I realized the genuine meeting of perseverance and teamwork. Submitting my final assignment on June 11th last year sounded crazy to some people, but I made a promise to myself and my teachers that I would put forth the work and effort toward each assignment every day. My attitude seamlessly transferred to this year as I acclimated to a new learning environment. I firmly believe that as, I, as long as I engage in my classes and give 100%, my teachers, administrators, and family will guide me and assist me in my endeavors. Each and every day is what I make of it. Once again, thank you Rotary Club for honoring me as your recipient and thank you to the Quakertown Community High School for your endless support. Again, this is from Junior Madeline Labange. And hopefully they are winning their soccer game tonight. I'm not sure of that right now, but I uh, just wanted to mention those four great students. I also want to thank, um, as you heard Madeline mention, the uh, Rotary Club for, for the great work they do with our students. Um, the, uh, Madeline will be awarded with a $100 uh, certificate to be used for her future. Um, so we, we always thank them. Unfortunately, with this uh, pandemic, we are unable to have our dinner and socially meet with them but they are still generous enough to continue to support and uh, help our students. So we like to thank them and also the Quaker Down community. Thank you, sir. Thank you, appreciate it. Congratulations to Madeline. She's an awesome athlete and a great scholar and, and her family, uh, we have Ms. Labange is a teacher of English language arts at Strayer Middle School. Um, Ms. Edwards, are you there? I see you. There you are. Are you ready to talk about enrollment? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, this information was shared with the redistricting committee um, at, I forget whether it was just last night or the week before, um, once the live birth data came out from um, the Pennsylvania Department of Health. 
Um, so our enrollment uh, projections going out through 20, 2025-26 uh, are driven by two different things. Um, one is that the live births in the municipalities that make up Quakertown School District have continued to decline. Uh, so last year, for example, there were 363 births. And then in 2019, there were only 334. So that downward trend continues. Um, and none of that would have been pandemic related because we're talking about uh, 2019 births. The other thing that um, has some impact on the projections is obviously the uh, pandemic related withdrawals that we had uh, from school. Um, we're, we are down 224 students this year overall um, in 2021. And it is reasonable to assume that some of those students will return to us um, when, the, um, when the environment around the pandemic has, has changed. So in order to smooth that out, there's several different documents that are posted in board docs, but the one that says live births with GPR five, meaning that I used a five year average in order to smooth out the impact of the pandemic related um, withdrawals would be the one that um, we would be using for budgeting and planning and, um, and so forth. But even so, um, our enrollment is now below 5,000 in this year. And by 2526, we would expect to be right around the 4,000 uh, mark. So the um, declining enrollment trend is continuing and in fact, accelerating slightly, um, even after smoothing out what I would think would be a one year um, decline based on, on uh, pandemic related withdrawals. So this, um, as I said, the elementary redistricting committee uh, has all of this information and a variety of you know, different analysis uh, things around it as they look at different options. Um, but it, it is clear that we would expect enrollment to continue to decline and if, if anything for that trend to, um, to accelerate slightly um, from what we've been looking at in the past few years. So that is the high level overview. Questions? Okay, let's move on. Ne next uh, presentation, as, as you recall back in June when the superintendent goals were uh, approved by the board, or I guess that was July, but in June when we were talking about them, it was making sure that we could report back to you on where we were in, in the big picture of in the question of learning loss. So we wanted to pre present a uh, good um, a, uh, discussion, uh, presentation and discussion on, on our benchmark uh, assessments that were delivered are taken by third to through eighth graders. So we have Aaron Oleska and um, Chad Evans from Dr. Hoffman's office, uh, the Office of Teaching and Learning. See, Dr. Hoffman's back with a big smile, so we're, life is good. So uh, Aaron and Chad, it's all yours. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a, a high level overview of our benchmark assessments this evening. We've had access to our data for a few days now and we're looking forward to digging more deeply into it in the next few weeks. Uh, we use these assessments and other assessments and the collection of data to make instructional decisions. One moment. So this is our agenda for this evening. Uh, an overview of what we'll be presenting to you. After providing an overview of our assessment context and the various ways we utilize benchmark data, we will share a summary of student performance and discuss potential COVID learning loss. Following, we will share macro trends and discuss next steps. To begin, we wanted to highlight and review our students' assessment history and provide context regarding our fall assessment. In the top chart, you will notice some differences between prior assessments and our new benchmark assessment tool. Most significantly, our testing environment for this fall varies as a result of students' learning modality. Below is a reminder that we have a gap in assessment data from the spring with statewide testing and benchmark testing canceled. 
Benchmark assessments operate best when they are seen as one component of a balanced assessment system. They are explicitly designed to provide the ongoing data needed to serve district, school, and classroom improvement needs. Uniform in timing and content across classrooms and schools, benchmark assessment results can be aggregated at the classroom, grade, school, and district levels for school and district decision makers, as well as for teachers. This interim indication of how well students are learning can fuel action where needed and accelerate progress toward annual goals. Benchmarks are only as valuable as the strategies we employ using that data. In this chart, we describe some of the ways we utilize this data to inform curriculum and instruction. If students were to take the spring state test right now, this is the predicted achievement based on historical probabilities of statewide norms. Important to consider is the fact that our students have not yet been taught these grade level standards. The prediction is the implied level of growth that students need to attain to maintain the same level of achievement. The green and blue columns show the percentage of students who are statistically likely to pass our state assessment. For the first two rows, you will notice this is an average of all students who took the benchmark from grades three through eight in ELA and two to eight in mathematics. Also included in that average is that in seventh and eighth grade, approximately 50% of our students who are in algebra one or two do not take the grade seven and eight mathematics benchmark. In looking at this table, one of the data points that we are always concerned with are our students who scored below basic in mathematics. Traditionally, our grade two students who are learning foundational mathematics skills struggle earlier in the year and gain momentum as they learn. This is the first time grade two students have taken a benchmark in the fall. Later in our presentation, Chad will share some macro trends from our data. Additionally, specific grade level data is broken down in the appendix to this presentation. It's important to note that every year students may potentially suffer some learning loss, but research indicates that this is highly individualized. For example, estimating summer learning loss is challenging in that when students return to school each fall, they typically take or complete an assessment based on the skills expected to be mastered at the end of their current grade level, not the prior school year. Clearly, regardless of the teacher, family, and our students' efforts throughout the spring crisis learning, the break from the school environment may have led to increased loss for some of our students. At this point in time, it is important to note that COVID-related learning loss is real, but there is no consistency in data collection approach, nor is there data readily available at state or national levels for comparison purposes. Here are some of the macro trends from our brief time exploring our data. In ELA, 61% of our students stayed the same or improved, where 39% of our students declined in performance. In mathematics, 50% stayed the same or improved and 50% declined in performance. Keep in mind, this is comparing the same students or cohort using a variety of tests and metrics, as well as using grade level benchmarks as a baseline. That baseline benchmark data is assessing students, again, on knowledge and skills they have not likely been exposed to at the time of the fall benchmark. Additionally, comparing the fall benchmark assessment to other assessments is not entirely an apples to apples comparison. We presume there is greater learning loss in mathematics compared to ELA, which follows the most current research on summer learning loss in general. It is also important to note that the 94% in ELA and 76% metrics represent that students are within one achievement level from the last data collection in winter. The trends are not irreversible here, and we know we can help our students to regain proficiency where they've lost it. We also wanna note that within this aggregated broad data, they represent our learners, each with her, their, um, his or her own unique skills, talents, and needs, and our mission, which hasn't changed, is to ensure that every student has an opportunity to grow each and every day. Here are our next steps with the benchmark data. Some of the highlights are to determine the instructional shifts, such as prioritizing focus on certain standards that our students are showing deficiencies in, and adjust adjusting our curriculum pacing. We'll continue to support our teachers with making those instructional shifts and differentiating for our learners. And our teachers and building teams will identify the individual student needs and subgroups via data team meetings. We do look forward to reporting out again after the mid-year mid -year benchmark um, to the board and to the public. 
And lastly, we want to, um, in consideration of our next steps, we wanted to share some of the realities on the ground in our classrooms and schools. For example, the impact of substitutes and staffing challenges has meant that many of our interventionists and coaches who are often tasked with providing the necessary scaffolds and supports to our most at-risk students and working with our teachers are unable to do so consistently, if at all. Even collecting data this fall has been an immense challenge for our teachers, interventionists, and our coaches. As we close, there are reference points in the appendix of the presentation that include grade level specific data, as well as some of the theoretical learning loss information. Again, we look forward to providing updates on our student progress in February after the mid-year mid -year benchmark assessment, which we believe will give us an even stronger indicator of our student progress. Thank you. Questions from the board. Yeah, I have a question and this is just a general one. Would you characterize the numbers that you're seeing as being what you expected to see better or worse than what you were expecting to see as far as, you know, especially the drop off? Dr. Aaron, go ahead, Aaron, first. All right. So I, I'm not sure that I, I could clearly predict what we were expecting to see. Um, as Chad presented with uh, the research on summer um, learning loss, it's about 30%. Um, and we know, especially in primary, with our primary students, if they're not continuing to read at home, um, we will see that loss. Certainly, uh, much of it is also dependent on what happens at home and, and uh, whether the students were continuing to read and, and work through um, the things that they've learned. So in short, um, I'm not really sure that I was able to make a clear prediction. Uh, I will say that from an ELA standpoint that, that I'm not disappointed with where we're at. Um, and I see a lot of opportunities for growth in this data. And, and I, I know our teachers are up to the task and we're working through it. Chad? Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that, um, you know, it, it is really difficult to make some comparisons because we have that gaps in data. But um, one of the, the charts in the appendix talks about how in ELA across the district aggregate, we lost about 8% of student um, growth and about 18% in mathematics. And it's probably not a fair way to think about it, but if you extrapolate that out with the consistent just summer learning loss of one and a half to two months in ELA and one and a half to three months in math, we were, we were below that and probably in the midpoint range in mathematics. So I would say that in my opinion, it's less than what many of the national experts expected. You know, they said 30% to 50%, and I don't believe that we've seen that. I do believe that our mid-year data will tell a very different picture, um, you know, for our students and our teachers as well. Please. Thank you. Dr. Hoffman. Sure, um, obviously I would echo what, what Chad and Aaron said, but I would just add that I think the other piece of this is that we were really excited to see how our new assessment would be used. And when we purchased that last year, we certainly weren't expecting for the first time to use it to be after um, you know, such a shift in instruction. But um, a benefit of that is that we do feel like it actually was, um, was a pretty reasonable um, look at the, at the data, like even though we don't have the uh, map to match it to. It does seem like it's pretty closely aligned, um, which is nice. And I think that's why we're looking forward to the winter data so that we can see once we have two comparison points with that same assessment, um, mm -hmm. what that looks like. And then the other piece just to look at, and this is something as we, as we said, we just got this data on Monday afternoon um, and started looking at it on Tuesday. So we do need a little more time with it, but there are some real interesting pockets where students actually outperformed where we would have thought they would be and not just one or two students but whole groups of students who actually grew quite a lot during the time that they were not in school and so looking into which um which areas maybe were better served by students um who were learning on their own over the summer um and and we haven't typically looked at that type of data in the past um which is why it's a little hard to predict exactly how much loss would have occurred during this time, but I think it'll be really interesting for us when we get some more national data coming out, which probably won't be to the end of the year in terms of where other districts fall to see um, where we are. But just as Chad said, really um, quite pleased that we didn't lose as much as um, was predicted by some of those national experts. Okay, thank you very I, much. It's, safe to like it's Keith, it, it's safe to assume though that, that the, the historical data you're going off of, which is the summer break, was sort of extrapolated, right? We were out of school since, what, mid-March? So I, I think, I mean, it would seem to me as though that 
we would have to expect this to be drastic drop-offs to some extent. I, I mean, you know, the kids weren't, weren't learning the same way. They had months where they weren't learning the same way. And so, I, I, I mean, I, is there anything, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the energy around, you know, the hype of the celebrating the successes, but what's the really the concerning aspect of it and how are we addressing that is my, my concern. And it has been my concern uh, through this whole pandemic. Sure. And I think just in general, to, to generalize that, which it really does need a deeper answer, but for the purposes of, of um, how much time we probably have here, which we've probably overdone our time, but um, it's important. It's important to remember that most students did receive instruction during the time that we are at home. It may not have looked um, like it does when they're in the classroom, but most students did engage with their teachers in most areas and did receive some instruction. So it wasn't completely like a summer break would be where there was no learning. Um, we also have to think about the fact, and I think um, it was in the in the part where, where Aaron spoke, but it may have been yours, Chad, I apologize, um, where we talked about how we are looking at some standards that we need to prioritize now that students are in front of us to make sure that if there was a standard that we feel really wasn't hit as much as it need, needed to be, or that the students didn't grasp it quite as much as they needed to, and they need some more direct instruction from teachers, that we are working with teachers to re-engage that conversation and find a way to put it in there. So, um, and, and that a lot of that comes from the classroom where we, you know, we're hearing from teachers, what are some things that they feel or skills um, that they feel students need to work on, and we'll work to, to put that into our plans. Well, Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Harner, is it possible instead of waiting until later in the year to, to possibly get some comparisons that we could utilize the IU in a situation like this and, and get some comparisons with the other county schools? Well, we could, well, we could get comparisons for what, we're, what we just did in our assessment, but I would re recommend against over-assessment. Give teachers the time. That what I would like to... to uh, talk, you know, one address Mr. Micucci's comment about you know, there is some significant loss. Yes, there is. And it was a tough, tough spring. Um, if, if students didn't engage in, in any intellectual work in the summertime, that, that then the normal summer loss is there. But frankly, like, uh, for Mr. Klein's question, you, you had a six month sabbatical from us as a board member, seven month sabbatical. And during that time, you missed some board meetings where you, the teachers have, you would have learned about what our teachers were doing from April or frankly, from the March 16th, Monday, March 16th, through the rest of the springtime. They stepped up to the plate. We had a really good game plan. Those who you would expect to be doing the work and having the support systems at home, those kids did the work and, and, and they did really well. Um, in turn, coming to the fall as we reopened, you, you, um, you, what you approved was allowing us kids, our students with, with disabilities, those who had, were uh, English language learners, others that were, were struggling back in school four days a week. So we were able to address that. So we've got the systems in place. The teachers are doing a, a bang up job with their instruction. Yes, they're, they're uh, burning the midnight oil and then they're working weekends, working on lesson plans. Also, the Office of Teaching and Learning is, is working on lesson plans to help the teachers, and we're looking at outsourcing um, to some, some of our seesaw work and some others so we can make it easier for teachers so they could focus on who's in the classroom. So I, I expect come February when the assessments are done in March when we give you the presentation that you're going to see some significant gains because every, you know, everyone's pull, pulling the oars at the right time at the same time. And I'm very pleased with that. Teachers are doing a great job and, is, and we have a good plan. Mr. Reimers, I know you're into this big time, I, please. Yeah, I, I had asked you in an email, just out of curiosity, which I guess it was more of a, a, a prediction, if you will, what you thought would be more significant going forward, whether it would be, um, looking at student growth metrics or whether we would be getting more, more uh, uh, impact from grade level uh, sort of proficiencies. 
and, and I was just curious on on, on that. I, I kind of expected it to be uh, more of the growth metric, so taking it from where we are to where we're we're going. That was just my my theory going forward. Uh, at the federal, at the federal, state, and uh, here at the local levels, the, worrying about uh, national assessments, local ass uh, state assessments, Keystone exams, PSSAs, they're going to waive all that kind of stuff, which right. takes a tremendous amount of pressure and 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 personal ownership and accountability off the teachers, so they can one worry about which is our next presentation, mental health, and the social emotional piece of learning here in the fall on students and also the mental health of our teachers takes that pressure off. So you're right, the growth is the most important part, but also the accountability part. What parents wanna know is, uh, and, and, and if, I, if my student was out in the school right now, though my kids are college graduates and post graduates and all that, if, if, if I was a parent, I would wanna make sure that my, my student had not lost um, any ground by the end of this year at the latest at the end of next year. We can't afford to lose ground at the high school level because our students are, are start getting their applications ready to go to college and they want to compete. At the lower levels, we have time. And so we need to take the stress and the pressure off of our, our faculties across the, the district and work on what you talked about, Brian, growth. Yeah, my, my big curiosity is gonna come in, in February and March when we see yes, the data to see what happened you know, I think someone had mentioned before from March through the summer, but also in this time when students are learning a new model of, of learning and teachers are, are kind of building on that too. So I think this period of time plays into that as well. Um, and I'll be curious on, on what happens and what we see in February and March. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Caitlin, I saw you, were, you have a question. I saw you. I on did, I did. Um, so I just wanted to talk about really something that we've talked about as a board and talking about our most vulnerable populations. And I think I'm really, it, like he said, I'm, I appreciate the enthusiasm and the commitment from our team to really address some of these um, deficits that we're seeing, not as bad as we thought it was in a lot of areas. Talk a little bit of, though about what we're seeing in regards to those with disabilities, learning disabilities, and how um, we talked a little bit about this, Dr. Harner, about how we did notice that they fell a little bit more in relation to these numbers. I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, Chad Aaron, who's drilled down into the data, talk about that. Our, so and Janet, Janet's unmuted, so I'm, I'd love to have Janet um, to share her thoughts. So as we mentioned earlier, you know, we just finished the window. So I, anything I would say to you right now would not, we've not gotten to that specificity where we've drilled down in individual students, which typically, you know, happens at the building level in terms of um, t data team meetings. Our principals and our teacher leaders do an incredible job at the building level, um, you know, looking holistically at a child, both the academic data and the social emotional piece. And so that's the work that, that they are desperate to do now that they have that data. And again, as we mentioned, we have some challenges right now, um, you know, when it comes to, to the work that they're doing because they are filling in and, and, and doing some other things. So I, I would start there and say that our job over the next couple of weeks is to help make that easier for our teachers um, and our teacher leaders in buildings to sift through that data and get down to that level. I, I will just tell you based on the fact that the window just closed, we just don't have that specifically to answer right now. No, thank you, that's okay. Janet? Sure, I would just echo the same thing. Our student um, students with IEPs, teachers have just begun that data collection. They uh, collected that first data point within the first several weeks of school, compared that to where our students were in March at that data collection. And then we'll be looking uh, in November, by uh, mid-November, right before uh, Thanksgiving break to see what the recruitment level is of our students. And then we have to make those decisions uh, with parents and IEP teams as uh, far as whether our students need those COVID compensatory services that I talked about at the other meeting um, that would be provided after school Saturdays and um, during the summer. Great. 
So we, we don't have that information yet. That's we're, per- we're dying to know as well, but um, you know, we're hearing things all uh, the whole gamut. Um, some students are fine. Some students have really regressed. Um, but we have them back in school, which is a good thing. And for the most part, some of our students are still home, but we're still providing services, which is really important for our kiddos. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Any more questions on this? We'll move on to the next topic. Thank you. Um, next topic is about the social emotional health of our students and our, and our faculty teachers out there. Um, we have uh, our, our work group leaders, co-leaders from the summer from the, that began their work in, in May and reported out in June and July and August. Um, we have uh, Kim Finnerty, assistant principal at the high school. We have Kelly Kramer from the Office of Teaching and Learning. They were the two co-leaders. We also have uh, uh, Owen Brenninger, who's the sixth grade center guidance counselor. We got Maureen Coonan from Strayer. We have Laura Gordon. Um, from representing all the elementary teachers. And we have the infamous De- uh, Doug Detweiler from the high school guidance office. So Doug, who is also a parent here in the community, has a high school senior. So he has the in and outs. And so we're going to talk about social, emotional, um, and mental health. You're on. Hi, thank you for this opportunity to update you on our work to strengthen our community and build social emotional competencies. Back in May, our building community task force um, agreed on one core belief, and that is that the heart of all learning is grounded in connection, community and relationships. Um, We truly believe that, and we know that to thrive academically, we, and when I say we, I mean our whole community, uh, students, uh, parents, and staff, uh, we need to be mentally healthy. Um, we need to feel safe. And so we need to prioritize our well being. Um, it takes a village. So, our village, the Office of Teaching and Learning, um, pupil services personnel, our behavior analysts, and more than 40 teachers and counselors work together throughout the summer um, to provide input, expertise, gather resources, and help train our teachers across the district in social emotional learning. Kelly Kramer, my co-chair on the task force, will uh, give a brief update on our work so far, and then the four counselors that we have here tonight, uh, who I'm very um, proud of their work, are gonna share some highlights and some challenges that we're seeing and dealing with. Um, in all of our schools at this time. So I will now turn it over to Kelly. Great, thank you, Kim. So our slide here discusses what is CEL. CEL, or social emotional learning, is the process in which we all, young children, all the way to adults, apply knowledge and skills throughout our lives related to the five competencies of CEL, as you can see there on our wheel. So why cell? Why is cell important? Cell leads to improvement in students' social emotional skills, attitudes, relationships, academic performance, and perceptions of classroom and school climate. Thanks, Kim. Research indicates we need to be mindful of these three components as we continue to navigate teaching and learning in these uncertain times. Educator well-being and awareness, effective conditions for learning, and social and emotional skills development. This graphic shows pre-pandemic research that when teachers are highly stressed, children show lower levels of both social adjustment and academic performance. Teacher stress and student stress are interrelated. This is relevant in our current teaching and learning environments. In my role as an instructional coach, I work with teachers and administrators on a daily basis. And while doing this work, the district leadership team and our building principals have shown empathy and are mindful that COVID is impacting us all.
This summer, our cell work centered around the three driving questions along the left side of the slide. This fall, we've implemented the strategies along the right side of the slide. Beyond implementing the first 10 days of cell lessons in our district-wide K-12 cell unit, Reunite, Renew, and Thrive, elementary teachers continue to develop and use cell content in their morning meetings. Our guidance counselors are now going to share some highlights and challenges related to cell and mental wellness at the building level. Thank you. Laura? Is Laura here? <laughs> I can't see on my screen. I only see the presentation. She's on the call. I think she's having trouble unmuting. Oh, no. Um, should we move on to middle school and then hopefully yeah, we'll circle back? That sounds great. Thank you. Great. All right. Go ahead, Owen. Don't worry, Marie and I were prepared to go off script. I tried to get her to coordinate our outfits tonight, but she I couldn't swear. So she said, as long as I had a tie on, I'd be all right though. Uh, <laughs> so I think you're gonna hear some common themes uh, amongst the three levels. Um, Marie and I are try gonna try to, we're gonna alternate a little bit between some of the bullet points. I think we're gonna try to keep it really specific to the middle developmental period. Um, but I, I think we, after meeting as a whole group, all the counselors, you're, um, we're probably gonna hear some, some common threads amongst all levels. So just starting with some highlights, we're definitely seeing, and I cannot emphasize this enough, a significant in, a decrease in acting out behaviors. So when I say acting out behaviors, I mean uh, behavior challenges in the classroom where some intervention is needed. Either my, a counselor gets called in, um, a principal has to do with, deal with discipline, um, a special ed teacher has to intervene. So more of our significant behaviors that either maybe take away from instructional time or a distraction to the learning process. I mean, they, they basically don't exist this year. Um, I actually don't think, to my knowledge, that we've had one ODR. So we have the uh, um, office disciplinary referrals um, as part of our school-wide program. I don't think we've even had one yet in, in our building for this year. Um, in some ways, I think it's almost been too quiet, which we'll, I'll talk about a little bit later in some of our challenges. Um, another highlight is, is our kids have been unbelievable in their compliance with our safety guidelines. Um, I was joking before the school year um, with the other counselor in our building, Ms. Lefebvre, that we were going to have to be the mass police this year and have our badges on. But as of today, I have not had to ask or talk to one kid about wearing their mask correctly, um, following our safety guidelines. The kids have been great. I mean, we're social creatures and occasionally they'll gravitate too close to each other in the hallways. But aside from that, um, they've been as safe as, as we can we could have hoped for. Um, and then my last point before I turn it over to Maureen is, you know, being a parent in 2020 is really, really hard. And I say that as, you know, now, since there are less behavior issues, I think myself and our staff um, has probably spent more time working with parents. Um, and whether that's on phone conferences, Google Meets, and um, I think the common theme is, is parents are, are doing everything and anything they can to make it work. Um, and if there's parents listening, I, I would say that's not being unnoticed by our staff. Um, and it's, it's extremely important to, um, to like to have this team approach that I think we've had this year more than ever, where um, it's this partnership between home and school um, with, with everything going on. I think there's some, some kind of feeling like we're all in this together. Um, and I think that's that's an important thing to highlight. Agree. I'm gonna uh, continue here with some of our highlights. And uh, one of the pieces is what we felt was really went really well this year was the back to school night at the middle school level. What we had decided to do since we couldn't get uh, parents into the building we decided to have videos. So all of the staff members created their own video of who they are, their course content, um, a picture of the room, um, the how to navigate their course, the grading policy, anything you'd want to know about that course, you could find in that video. 
And what I loved about the videos is they were so thorough, but they can be used at any time now. New students coming in, parents that are students that are struggling in the class can revisit those, those videos. And that was so much better than the old fashioned run around to your classrooms, have 10 minute glimpse of your teacher and then run around to the next classroom. So parents, I think, got a thorough feel for who their, their kids are seeing as teachers and also the content of the course and how it all operates. But that wasn't all that the teachers did that night. When they, they put those videos together, but they also held live Google Meets for parents to jump in at any point during that time. Very easy to link to all of us and to ask any further questions that the videos may not have answered. So I thought that was a really uh, positive thing that happened this year. And I also echo what Owen said. I thank all those parents who came on that night to support us and to give positive feedback to all of us. And I'll tell you, we really appreciate it with the stress that we're under. Another thing that we felt was a highlight was the, um, the schedule of the day. The early dismissal of one o'clock, not only did it help get the children out with their lunches and eliminate that a social, you know, create that social distancing and not have to worry about um, the lunchroom situation. But it also allowed us as staff members to reach out to, to our families, to our virtual kids. It gave us that quiet time, that uninterrupted time to have meetings, IEP meetings, 504s, GIEPs. And it was better attended than the traditional way of trying to get everybody scheduled together, the travel time, uh, what works with, with parents' um, schedules as far as their work schedule. Uh, with this virtual meeting availability, it's allowed parents to pick up a phone or a computer and jump on when we could all gather together very quickly. So things, meetings and things were happening in a, a very timely manner um, with that early dismissal. Along with the, the way that the layout was with the block, the block scheduling. The layout allowed kids to focus on just the four classes per day. And it gave them that, that way of time managing if they could just focus on the four each day. That outside of Wednesdays. Wednesdays, it, although it was a break in the week and we we're doing things a little differently, it became a real overwhelming stress for the students. Uh, we found as counselors talking with students that Wednesdays, because there were seven periods of new class learning, they felt very pressured to make those uh, Google Meets, get the work done, not be late to their next Google Meet, and try to make their way through the day. Students that were sports kids that were trying to make it back for their their um, sport, sporting events were finding that there was an overlap. They were trying to get to um, a sporting event, and they were missing out on the Google Meet of their last class. So we had a little glitches there with, with the scheduling of Wednesdays. Um, the biggest concern, now moving into a little bit of our challenges, the um, students and parents that have uh, reached out to the counselors are sharing that their, their big worry is that next month with the new scheduling, that will every day look like Wednesday with coming in and having seven periods every day now with only 30 minute time for the instruction and then going home and once again, having to complete things on your own um, as a child. So navigating the, the challenges, we're still working through those things. Um, Canvas, uh, our technology department, I thought did a fantastic job with getting things to look uniform for all of the courses and having that big orange get started button. That really helped the, the students and the parents know where to begin. The, the navigating within the get started button, depending on the course and depending on the teacher, the, the um, students were still having a little bit of trouble navigating their lessons, where to find the resources, where to find Google Meets and things like that. Um, the, the biggest challenge that we were finding as a guidance team was the work completion. And I think our teachers would agree with that. And I don't, I, I, I have it on that slide as, as the failure rate. Um, there are more failing grades in marking period one this year than we've ever seen 
ever in any any school year. And I've been here a long time. But I wouldn't say it's failure rate because the kids are being lazy. Um, it's, it's about the the trauma that that has been created through this all of this uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, the kids are at a point where they're transitioning in, into a new style of learning. So we've got a learning curve there. Uh, we're noticing that the work they are getting in, many of those kids, the, when they do submit assignments are getting good grades, but the amount of missing assignments is what's pulling the grades down. So the the F is, is look, looking, um, looking horrible for them. And these are kids too, when, when as counselors, we look at their historical grades, their historical grades are A's and B's, and now they're pulling F's and these kids are not used to pulling F's. So as counselors, we've been trying to reach out to these kids to help them with these this daunting feeling of this overwhelming amount of work. Um, our teachers are still doing a fantastic job in trying to keep up the rigor of their class, but at the same time, the students are feeling that overwhelming sensation of the amount of work and it's, it's not about the rigor. The kids are telling me they can handle that part. It is the quantity that they're feeling overwhelmed with. The amount of Google Meets, the videos, the readings, the lesson submissions um, from all of the teachers. And when you think about all of the teachers, you're also talking about your related arts teachers. So these classes where kids used to have their stress relief and their, their hands-on experiences, those classes now for the, the virtual kids and for the hybrid kids are turning into videos as well or things that they have to to instruct themselves on and then do their hands-on learning so again it's not a blame game it's about the reality of our covid crisis right now and the the crisis itself is hitting families in different ways that we've been seeing as well and we're seeing families being stretched financially because of the crisis situation, that there's a lack of daycare and the, it's creating our middle school kids. And we've had um, several middle school kids reach out to us to let us know that they are watching younger siblings. And I'm not talking about elementary age kids that are going into schools. I'm talking about kids that are not old enough to be in school yet. And they're watching those kids because their parents are working so their school day cannot start until their parents get home from work. And that's leaving them with a lot of stress in the evening time to just begin to do their work. For those families that don't have the younger sibling issue, we're seeing uh, parents that have to work, both parents or single families or single parent families. And students on their hybrid days are unsupervised and they're trying to create a, a school model um, mode all by themselves with nobody to ask questions to. Um, the students share that they will reach out to their teacher by email, but because of the situation we're in, they may not get a response from those emails until later on. And at that point, more time has gapped in their day to get work done. At home, typically, as you all know, kids have been home for six months before they started back to school. There's been a habit that got formed there and the habit of of being out of that school mode. And there's a lot of distractions at home. So we're asking again, remember these kids are 12 and 13 years old and we're asking them to try to put those, those um, distractions aside. What's happening is that they, they are developmentally just learning how to do time management. They're just learning how to handle stress. And those are the things that we're trying to teach them at this level in their life. And without knowing those strategies, they're hitting their stress peak. And any human being that hits that stress peak, as you would know, is gonna hit that fight or flight method and the fighting it out or, or flighting it and just quitting. So this goes for not only our, our, um, our needy kids, but our honors kids. I've heard from a number of honors kids and their families and their parents saying that they're trying to fight it out. Their stress levels are so high, but they're feeling like they're gonna burn out. They're working from morning till late in the evening and they're working on their weekends. They don't feel like they have that time to, to stop and just be a kid. Um, for our needy kids and our mental health um, at-risk kids, we're seeing kids um, breaking down and giving up. 
it's very hard then when they break down and give up, they close their computer. And it's very difficult for us as counselors to reach out to them either by telephone or email or um, trying to reach parents as well. It's been very difficult and uh, worrisome for us with those kids with mental health issues. So in this time of crisis, things are, are just intensified uh, for our teachers reaching out to parents, alerting them of grades, and then the parents getting upset with kids because these grades are falling, and then the kids just feeling lost. So again, not a blame game here. It's just a reality check that these 12 and 13 year olds are really struggling and we're doing our best to reach out to give them that, that time management piece to handle. Um, come next month, all the things, the strategies that we've given them with the, with the uh, time management of four classes a day will then now have to shift and they will transition once again to a brand new style of learning. So um, that just gives you a, kind of a, a snapshot of the, the, um, the middle school pieces and Owen's gonna finish it up from here. And just to echo some of the things Maureen said, um, that even more so with our sixth graders, you have to remember like Canvas is new to them. So even when they're in front of us, if we went back in our time machine to this time last year, it's a huge learning curve from a technological, te technological standpoint um, to get the kids up to speed. They're going from Seesaw to Canvas and even you know, a lot of colleges use that as a learning online learning platform. So when they're in front of us every day for five, six weeks, it's still hard for them to understand how to navigate it, save things, submit things correctly. So now that we, you know, some teachers, a lot of them only see them one day a week. A, a lot of it, you know, they're only coming to school two days. We don't, some kids we don't see at all. It's really hard, um, especially for our first time middle school families and parents. Um, you know, what we find is if there's an older sibling in the house that obviously uses Canvas and has, has done it before, that helps significantly. Um, but it's a real struggle for our first time middle school families kind of making that jump, especially coming off of what, where it was optional last, last spring. Um, and then as far as like just looking at the, I mentioned, I kind of teased this earlier, um, although it's quiet in the building, I, I worry and I think some of my colleagues worry that it's maybe too quiet. Um, you know, normally when you, when you come into our building, there's a lot of hustle and bustle. You can hear the energy. We almost have to get on the announcements sometimes and remind the kids not to be too loud in the hallways or in the lunch rooms. You know, right now they don't have lunch. They're in the hallways, they're not allowed to talk to each other. There's really no downtime. Usually in, in both buildings, we have a resource period, which is like a, a directed or guided study hall period where the kids do work, but that's time that they can talk to each other. Um, between the social distancing rules, the wearing of masks, um, only half the kids being there, um, it's, it's really like limiting their, their social interactions. And I just worry, and I think of my colleagues worry, what's the long-term impact of that the longer it goes on for? I mean, it, social skills is exactly that, it's a skill. And just like any skill, you have to practice at it and you have to fail at it. Um, just like, you know, first time you dribble a basketball, you dribble off your foot, you might crash your bike, learn to play the saxophone, you, it might hurt your parents' ears, but you practice and you keep getting better at it. And I, I worry that, are we, are we not giving them enough opportunity for those things? Um, and, and, and just because of the safety rules. So I think that's, that's a concern. Um, you know, I've had teachers say, hey, like, is it strange that some of my kids, like, I can't get anyone to volunteer for classes? Um, now, it's new, especially we have to remember our sixth graders are completely new. So, like, we're all strangers wearing masks to them. So, there's going to be some sort of, you know, period of adjustment for them and, and to build their rapport. Um, but again, that, I think the longer that that has to go on for, um, the longer, the, the greater the concern is. And the last thing is, um, you know, just kind of giving the lay of the land as far as the staff mental health status. You know, I think we have staff that um, was having a hard time making the adjustment initially to the different cohorts and um, kind of figuring out, you know, how much energy and time to put into this or that, or how much workload to give people or how to support our families that we're not seeing, how to manage the, the, the email volume that's coming through. Um, I think a lot of our teachers are, are, are kind of getting their feet underneath them and kind of going awake a week at a time or a day at a time. Um, but I still think there's some teachers that are really struggling. Um, I also think there's some teachers that are really nervous, um, staff members about, um, you know, bringing all the kids back. So, um, but honestly, I, I think I could, when, I can't just say that about teachers. I can say that about kids. I can say that about parents that I talk to. I, and I think it just comes back to we're all in this together. It's not just the staff that feels that way. When Every time I talk to parents on the phone, I get those the same steady drumbeat. Even when I talk to kids, sometimes I, I get those feelings. So 
Um, I, I think again, the, the theme is like being in this together and trying to get through this together and everyone trying to make it work. And I think, you know, people were just at the point where we're, we're, we're a little exhausted, a little overextended, a little overwhelmed. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know, I, I try to remind people we're, we're not in year seven of this hybrid model. You're, we're in week seven. So I think Thank it would be a totally different story if, if we've been doing this for a while. It's it new, change is hard, new is hard. And I think at the middle levels, because it's two transition years too with the kids, it's really hard for them. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Maureen. Laura, are, do you have comms with us? Yes, you're I, I, up. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Sorry, I apologize for that. I had my stereo setting set to something else for a group I was doing um, the other day. So thank you for your patience. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Gordon, and I am the school counselor at Trombowersville Elementary School. I'm honored to be here this evening to speak on behalf of my elementary colleagues regarding the mental health and wellness of our students, families, and staff members. To begin with some highlights at the elementary level, as a counselor, I'm thrilled to see that time has been embedded into our teachers' daily schedules to allow for direct instruction in social emotional learning. Now more than ever, our students need this support and direct instruction and skills that will help them to cope with the stress of our current situation. At a recent um, TPO meeting that we had at our building, um, one of our parents shared that the SEL lessons were powerful and were doing what they were supposed to be doing. So that was some helpful and positive feedback that we received there. Um, it's also been helpful having time embedded into our teachers, teacher schedules for daily morning meetings, and that's helped um, for teachers and staff to further develop those important connections with students, particularly those students who are virtual and may be feeling um, a little bit disconnected. Another highlight is the outpouring of parent praise and appreciation for the tremendous work and dedication of our teachers, which has helped to keep many of us afloat during this stressful time. So we do thank you to those parents and family members who have reached out to express their gratitude and support for our staff members and teachers. I encourage you to continue to do so. Um, your words and support mean a lot more than you may know. And of course, our biggest highlight at the elementary level is our students. I think I can speak on behalf of all of my colleagues when I say that they are the reason that we continue to do what we do every day, as challenging as this school year has been. And to see their little smiling faces in person, even though they are behind masks, um, does help to remind us what we do, why we do what we do. And it helps us to remember to just keep swimming. Um, an initial concern I know that we did have at the elementary level was how difficult that it might be for our little ones to comply with some of these regulations, such as mask wearing and maintaining social distance. Um, but our students have done a phenomenal job of following these safety guidelines. And it's actually been really fun to see them mummy walking down the hallway to maintain the six feet of distance. And I'm happy to demonstrate that if, if anyone would like to see it. Um, alongside these highlights, however, our school community has also faced many challenges. At the elementary level, we have seen an increase in anxiety in many of our students. They don't quite know how to make sense of this new world that we live in, where they can't hug their teachers or play in close proximity with their friends. Many have shared with me that they are fearful of the virus or of family members getting the virus, and many struggle to adapt to the new safety rules that are in place from procedures on playground equipment to spacing in the classroom. So this at times has resulted in an increase in some negative behaviors as our students struggle to return to the routines of the classroom after being home for an extended period of time. That can be a tough transition for some of our students. And although many of our students are very excited to be back in person, this excitement is also at times coupled with tears and frustration over managing the new expectations of a COVID learning environment. For our families, uh, many of our families have shared that they are struggling financially, some having lost jobs due to circumstances relating to COVID, or they may be struggling to juggle working while also arranging childcare for students who are fully virtual, virtual due to quarantine regulations or requirements or due to the shortened in-person school day. The sense of teamwork between home and school is definitely stronger now more so than ever, which is definitely a positive, but it has proven to be overwhelming for many of our families. 
And um, for our staff, on behalf of our staff, I could not be more honored to work with such a dedicated, hardworking group of individuals. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say that our teachers have gone above and beyond in this difficult moment to do everything in their power to do what is best for our students. And this being said, our, our staff are struggling. They're stressed out and they're overwhelmed. Our teachers are struggling to adjust to the current constraints presented by COVID-19, which has been simultaneously striving to, while simultaneously striving to deliver quality instruction on a daily basis. Time management has also proven to be a challenge with the additional responsibilities of pacing and planning, especially for the virtual students and especially for our primary level teachers. It's also been difficult for many of us as a staff to find that balance between following the health and safety plan and delivering necessary and beneficial interventions for some of our neediest students that oftentimes include small group interventions and working with students in close proximity. So it's tough to balance the, those two um, things out as well. And at the end of the day, we all do the work that we do because we genuinely care about and love our students. And so it's really difficult for a lot of our staff at times who have shared with me that they feel as though they aren't meeting the needs of all of our students or aren't able to give enough due to some of the constraints that have been placed on them by time, resources, or just by COVID in general. Um, so, you know, as a result of many of these challenges, the continued focus on the social emotional health of our school community is absolutely critical now more so than ever. And we are grateful that QCSD has placed an extra emphasis on the social emotional learning this school year for our students and our staff and families. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'm very grateful for your presentation. Doug Detweiler, Doug, from the high school perspective, what do you see? Well, you're going to hear again some common themes and, and yeah, some things that are obviously each of us are addressing issues that are age specific to the groups that we work with. Uh, on the highlight side, we've seen some parent and student virtual workshops a success. Obviously, we're not bringing speakers in anymore for right now. So we're turning that over to virtual workshops. There was a Minding Your Mind workshop done earlier this week, uh, av available for parents. Um, I believe that Mr. V will be pushing that out in early November for those that couldn't or didn't sign up for it, that they have about a week, my understanding is, to view that. Uh, we will be doing a virtual assembly, um, either uh, through the health classes or another venue for one day uh, at the middle school level and at the high school with some of the speakers um, that are young adults mm -hmm. that can engage well with students um, that will, again, bring that what we would normally experience in the classroom to the classroom in a virtual way, or to parents in a virtual way. Our college application process, again, usually an evening seminar for parents, usually heading into classes to talk with students. Um, because we value the class time that our students, the limited time that they're with their teachers, we're not gonna go into classrooms. So we've put that online, students can view that and have viewed that. Uh, and so that's been, a, that's been a positive. College and military visits, we have a whole host of uh, typical, um, you know, schools, the military that will come in and do sessions face-to-face -face now in the afternoon after our students' day is done so it doesn't interrupt their, their work day, we offer these after school. Uh, I've sat in on a number of them myself. Uh, Meet the Teachers Night was, was a really great virtual event. So we've seen some real highlights there. And again, there's some flexibility with some of those things where people can view the workshops on their own time. So that's, that's been positive. Students seeking out counselors. That's, um, that's something without question. I answered an email in, at, at five or seven tonight when I was coming to log on from a young man that reached out to me that probably hasn't reached out to me in the three other years I've worked with him. And so we have more and more students connecting with us, whether they're hybrid students, whether they're um, virtual students. Um, so that's been a real positive for us. Uh, Teachers and counselors are, and administrators are reaching out to hybrid and virtual students, being very aggressive with that, uh, especially for our students that we sense are not engaged or struggling. So that's been a, a very positive thing. Um, at the academy, which is the uh, high school program that is over by the district service center, uh, they have transitioned. They have their thought questions posted online for students as a daily check-in. So even though if they're not seeing them, they check in with them. Their student development groups are transitioning to online social-emotional learning lessons. 
Um, they are a more online-based program, so I think their, their transition has maybe been a little smoother um, because the, their students are used to that, so that's been going well. Um, off the screen there and positives, as I've kind of contemplated this, just again, want to re reiterate that the appreciation that I have heard from students and parents uh, has just been really encouraging. Uh, have had uh, positive contacts with the students and parents and, and just genuine appreciation. And I, you know, I, I would just say for those of you that are parents that are listening to this, again, thank you very much for that, for your patience, because there's always glitches in the system. For those of you that um, have younger children, uh, I have uh, my sixth child graduating from the high school this year. I have five Quakertown grads. And I've said to my wife, boy, am I glad this didn't happen a number of years ago when we had a whole herd of kids in the house that were every two years apart, um, because it's stressful. And I really appreciate those of you parents that are working with that on a day in and day out basis. Um, collaboration is another thing that's been kind of neat to see. As, as the teachers and students have navigated through the workload and teachers trying to adjust to how much is enough, how much is too much, um, I will have students who will share with me, look, I kind of feel like I'm drowning here in the pace. Um, as Maureen said earlier, sometimes it's not because the work's too hard, it's just the pace of it. And so I've said to students, look, send a respectful email to your teacher, let them know what you're seeing. I've had teachers tell me they want that from, from students um, because they're trying to gauge it too. And so um, there's been a real good spirit of collaboration. I really do believe that um, there's just a, a, a strong sense of community and um, so I'm very, I'm very thankful for that. So those are some of the highlights. Uh, every, we have challenges too. Maintaining communication with virtual and hybrid, hybrid students. That, that's, you know, that's, that's hard sometimes. The young man that emailed me earlier tonight, thankfully he's a B hybrid student. I'm gonna catch him first thing tomorrow morning. So that's real positive. Um, students sometimes will set up Google Meets or we'll set up Google Meets and, and they miss them. Um, Sometimes with our college reps, we are not maybe seeing the volume we'd like to see, even though we've advertised it well. And so I, I was talking to a young lady this afternoon as I did a Google meet with her for the whole college application process. And after we spent some time together, you know, I had suggested it, it'd be a great idea if you would come into one of these virtual meetings with these uh, college, college representatives. Some of those are, if you, if you attend the one where your schools you're applying to, you can sometimes meet the person that's going to look through your application. It's kind of nice for them to get a face in the name. And I could tell by the way that she looked at me, uh, and since we were doing a Google Meet, I could see her whole face and she could see mine, <laughs> um, that, you know, I, I asked her, I said, listen, is it hard for you to go online after your school day because you've just had enough of being online? And she said, absolutely. So uh, whether it's a real term or not, I think online fatigue hits about everybody. I think people get tired of seeing their emails, getting the... Uh, Google Meet invitations, and, and I get that. We're all adjusting to that, to, to the fact that communication is, is, is challenging during this time. I think people have full inboxes, whether it's parents, whether it's students, whether it's teachers. Um, there are times where I know I would have got speedier responses pre-COVID, but it's hard for everybody to keep up. And so, you know, that's where we, we uh, I think it's important to extend grace, to show some kindness, to show some patience, um, attributes that are all good for us to learn, although not easy. Um, and, and, and it has its humorous moments too. I was speaking with a young man um, who was a hybrid student, so he was in my office and we had set up a Google Meet for the following week to touch base to see how he was doing and his you know, improving academically and got on the Google Meet and he wasn't there. The next few, few days later, he emails me, he said, hey, I missed my Google Meet. And I said, yeah, I emailed you. And he said, yeah, I'm still getting used to that. I guess I should check my email more, laugh out loud. <laughs> So to which I said, yeah, I think you probably should. So again, that being said, communication is a learning process um, and, and that makes it a challenge. For us at the high school level, instability of schedules, we've done a lot of students moving from um, hybrid to virtual, uh, some coming the other direction when we've been able to do that. It's complicated when they come to a hybrid schedule, we have to look if there's enough seats in each individual classroom because of the social distancing. Uh, so again, now we're pretty much done that right now, but that, that took a lot of time in the beginning as people work through that. Equity issues we're concerned about. Um, if we have students who don't have internet access at home, now if we know that, we can reach out to technology, we can get a hotspot. Um, 
But for some of our students that are in, in households where parents may not speak English and they need help with their homework, it, it can be a challenge. Failure rate. Now, I put that in quotes on my notes because nobody's failed anything yet. We're, we've got a half a marking period left, just a little less than that. But the amount of students, and I would echo this with what I believe was Maureen said, the amount of students that are struggling at this time in the marking period is definitely higher. Now, interestingly enough for me, as I looked at my own numbers on my grades nine through 12 caseload, the least amount of students that were, and I, I, I should stop there. It's not like half the kids are failing. So, so I, I don't wanna push the panic button there. But when I look at the numbers being higher and I look by grade level, the students that were struggling the most were in ninth grade, then a little less numbers for 11th grade, a little less for 10th, and the seniors were in the best shape. And that really makes sense. It is a maturity issue for time management and self-discipline. Um, so, I, I, but overall, we're definitely seeing higher numbers. And again, the, on the, going back to that highlight side, side, that's why I've had students reach out to me. Um, again, the young man that I interacted with earlier tonight said, listen, I've never had grades that have been this low. I'm not sure if it's the pace. I'm not sure if it's this virtual environment you know, versus hybrid. And so, you know, he's looking at that very seriously, uh, which, I, which I appreciate. So it is not just students who have traditionally struggled and it's not just special education students. Um, it, it goes across the board as people adjust to this. Uh, yes, again, parents, students, staff are often stressed and overwhelmed. And I think that's where um, the power of an encouraging word is really important for us all to keep in mind um, because um, this is not gonna go away overnight. And so we're in it for a longer haul here. And yet I, I can sense this, and I have had conversations with every one of those groups and can sense that. Um, I, unique, a little bit more to the high school is many of our students are working. Now, some of our students are working and some of their paychecks may be helping out at home financially. And that, that happens pre-COVID or during COVID, maybe even more during COVID. But some of our students, especially those that are good workers, are getting offered more hours by their employers because they've had a lot of loss on staff. And so that is uh, a challenge. It becomes a challenge for them, time management. So, you know, you have to have that conversation that just because it's available doesn't mean you should take it. You've got to try and keep your priorities straight. But again, that's an opportunity that students are having more now uh, to deal with than before. A lot of them, um, you know, another student I talked to just, just today, uh, had shared with me that, yeah, Wednesdays are hard for him because he's at home, he's got younger siblings, they're uh, going crazy in the house and he's trying to do his work. And so, you know, there's, a, there's definitely that challenge. Um, so that's pretty much, uh, I guess, what I would, what I would say here. Um, I would echo what Laura said, um, and I'll speak to as a parent here, that um, I've been very thankful to have every one of my students graduate from high school. I've had five that have graduated from high school, uh, five have graduated from college. They transitioned well to college because they got a good education in our high school. Um, and my sixth child is a senior. And even though we're going through tough times now, I can honestly say that I totally appreciate the dedication that I see in uh, the, at the teaching staff, our administrators, our school nurses, every all the support staff. It's it's, I feel honored to have my son going through there and for his senior year, and I feel honored to be there. Um, so I just wanna say that I've been very thankful for that, not just as a professional, but as a, as a parent as well. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, very, very grateful for your comments. Thank you very much um, to Kelly, our counseling team for sharing your insights. Um, I'd just like to close with a few next steps. Strayer has rolled out, and the high school is going to be rolling out next week, access uh, to a lifestyle social wellness app at the secondary level. Um, it's called Atlas. It's for all students. And I'm pretty excited about this um, because the app is designed to support student mental health and wellness. Um, it's very relevant to teen lives today. They can access short podcasts that help them alleviate stress, manage academic pressure, um, develop healthy relationships, um, hopefully get better sleep. So there's lots of uh, neat opportunities for them to be introduced to wellness techniques, strategies, and just ideas for them to hopefully be happier and more productive uh, in their lives. Um, and during this you know, crazy COVID time, 
The other nice thing about this app is that it addresses the problems of social isolation and um, loneliness. And that's very real for many of our, um, our students and, and, and even uh, families. So parents can use this, um, and teachers can use the app. Um, I've had it on my phone for a few weeks while we've been um, getting ready to roll it out. Uh, the other thing we're doing is the ongoing professional development in our monthly staff meetings, um, just on focusing on taking good care of ourselves and uh, the AIM curriculum. AIM stands for Accept, uh, Identify, Move, and it's a program that blends uh, mindfulness and uh, acceptance commitment therapy and uh, I think one other applied behavior analysis. Um, and that approach just helps uh, students deal with, you know, who are struggling with social and emotional issues. Um, and uh, our pupil services department has um, supplied all of our buildings with access to that curricular resource. So I'm really proud of our teachers, our counselors, my fellow administrators, uh, just for being models of strength and resilience. You know, in my opinion, at this time, there really is and nothing more important than we could be teaching our kids than um, adapting and persevering uh, through all the challenges that we're facing right now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody that presented uh, any questions from the board. I did have a couple, of course. Please. In my nature. Um, so I, I had uh, a couple questions for the secondary uh, counselors. Um, Maureen, and I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get your last name when you said it, but um, I, I did uh, wanted to speak about block scheduling because, again, I, I feel a little bit of guilt with this because I've been so vocal in pushing for the elimination of the block scheduling. And the, the reason that I had for it was basically the arts and the music and how in the middle school they were um, sort of pushed aside and only given one semester of the art you know, the arts or the music. And, you know, I, I speak to a lot of parents who, who said, you know, that's what their, their kids live for. You know, they, they get up in the morning, they go to school because they like being in choir, or they like playing their instrument, they like being in the band or in the theater. And having those things taken away for half a year was devastating to them. And this also goes into the high school with the tech school kids, you know, having because of the block scheduling you know those tech school kids were missing a full day of work so I, i'm not necessarily opposed to tech school and i would still um you know I, I don't know where they are in the planning process of reopening the um the secondary schools to five days but you know I, I would say we could try to keep the block scheduling as long as we can get the band and choir kids in you know, and the, the art kids in full year and get the tech school kids in every day. I mean, if there's a solution to keep block scheduling and be able to, to have those things, I think that would be very important, especially for the mental health uh, aspects of this. You know, my, my daughter's very big into the band and choir and theater. And, you know, for a long time in the beginning of this whole process, she felt hopeless. She felt, I'm not going to be able to sing all year. I'm not going to be able to play my instrument. We're not going to have any plays or musicals. And to her, that was more devastating. She's a straight A student. She gets very good grades, but she did not want to be told. Or, you know, she felt that the whole reasoning for her being in school was those arts. And she didn't want to miss out on those. There's my younger one there. So to that, and then uh, for Owen and Mr. Detweiler too, um, you know, if the, do you believe that these failure rates will improve once the kids come back to five days? Um, and, you know, what can we do to, to help the kids at home? You know, what message could we, could we give to the kids to say, you know, how to be more engaged? I, I don't really know the answer to that, but, but, you know, I, I do see it. In fact, I, I really thought my younger daughter who was just in the room was going to come back with these terrible marks and everything. And we just got her, uh, her, um, you know, map scores here and they're, they're very good. But when she's here working virtually with us, it, it was a mess. She, she couldn't, she couldn't focus. She couldn't keep up. And we thought that she was falling behind, but I guess those few days that she was in school, she really made up for all that. So, you know, those are my questions. Those are my thoughts. Um, I'll let you guys 
And I don't mind starting to address your question about the failure rate. Um, and I would say that that's a that's a that's probably the most frequent conversation I have with with our staff, um, just because um, they're seeing um, numbers that they're not used to. Uh, and I, I think a lot of our teachers, at least I know in our building, take it personally when they have uh, uh, someone on their roster that's not failing. Um, so I, I do believe based on the feedback I get from them and just in my professional opinion, it will be significantly easier when the majority of kids do return the five days. I just think that's what they're used to. Um, I think there'll be, again, another adjustment period as they adapt to maybe a new schedule and just a new routine in general. Um, but I, I, I don't. I don't see how it could be a positive impact. All right, and I would say that it's, it's um, we're trying to get a handle on um, what that looks like in terms of improvement. Uh, Chris, um, certainly I have had contacts with students who were on my list because I was concerned that are starting to hand more work in because now they're adjusting. Um, we still will have some of those students who will remain virtual and not be coming back for those five days a week. So um, again, that's what we're working on. I, I, I hope that um, returning to the five-day schedule will be an asset for some of those students that are struggling. Again, there are some students, I, you know, one of the students I talked to earlier this week and um, just in listening to him, I felt that, um, and he's a 100% virtual student, I thought that maybe it would be wise for him to return to, uh, to when he had the option, November 18th, to come face to face. And you know his concern was, I believe he has a grandparent living with him. So he's gonna remain 100% virtual. So again, we're gonna be working through those uh, adjustments. Uh, the kids that are, you know, we have the higher rate. I'm optimistic that we're gonna see some gains in that before we transition to the five day um, uh, back face to face. And so that's, that's pretty much what, how I would answer that. And just to extend on what, what Doug shared there, as far as in the, over the next three or four weeks till we do have that transition, like our students who are failing a, a single class or struggling in a single class, I can almost across the board, that teacher has been in contact at least multiply, multiple times with that student and that family um, through Google Meets, through just conferencing with the parents. Um, for our, our kids that we're finding that have multiple great uh, core, especially core classes that, that are that in danger of failing or in the failing zone, that's when if we go up like the intervention tiers, um, now our, our office team is getting involved. So you, like uh, whether it's me, whether it's our, our support staff um, or special ed, um, just any way that we can increase our supports. But in some ways we, do, we can only extend so far. I think that's some of the challenges, especially with our full virtual and our, for our sixth graders that are really struggling with the technology piece and our families that are really struggling with that, I think we kind of run into a, a dead end in some spots where we, 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 we're trying everything and anything and, and trying to be creative and trying to support. Um, but I think we're finding, at least with our younger kids, it's, it's just a little harder. Like Doug said, it's not a coincidence that the seniors are doing better than the freshmen. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing with our sixth grade. An interesting <laughs> Chris is that we have at the high school level not at the the other uh, K through through eight but at the high school level more students going out on virtual than so we're going to be at 25.6 percent come the 18th so over a quarter of our students are going to be uh, taking the virtual option so that's going to be good for social distancing and all that Other question, any other questions for the group? I think Marie was marvelous job. Was Great job. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to address your question, Chris, about um, the the kids with the that want to do the the band, the chorus, and all of that. And I'm right there with you. The kids, if it's their passion, that's what gets them to school when they have those things. Um, as far as being able to schedule that with a block scheduling, I don't I know that there's a logistic piece to it. But more, um, more questioning in my mind is the, the COVID crisis piece. Like right now, the kids that are doing band or chorus, um, the band kids are going outside where they can have that fresh air and be able to blow their instruments. And I went out there and I said to the kids, oh my gosh, what a cool classroom. And they looked at me like, it's not cool, our fingers are freezing. 
so like the, there is still that um, that crisis piece of can we make it work? Um, my own daughter, I don't think that she would have survived it had they not started sports. So I, I hear you as a parent that the, the passionate kids that there's one thing that gets them in the door. And we do want to keep those things going with the, the art and the music and um, the health, health and phys ed, the phys ed, they're not, they're, they're not doing a heavy phys ed. They're not changing. You know, there's a lot of pieces to the COVID, um, getting them back on stage. Uh, I, I know over the summer, some of the outdoor theater groups were doing with the masks, but I don't know how that would work safety wise in the building on a stage. So I, I can't really answer those. I wish, I wish I had an answer for that stuff, but the block scheduling, I know I can tell you that the kids can re they can focus on four when it's, when they have the block. And what they're telling me is that with the 80 minute period, they get their, their little instruction from their teacher and then they're able to get to work and then ask questions while they're in the classroom. So they, they do enjoy that and they feel like they accomplished something within the 80 minutes with their teacher uh, having that block. Hope that helps. I just wanted to make a comment and, and thank you all for this information. I have to say at times it was heartbreaking for me and difficult for me to listen to. But it, it's the honest truth of what I have felt is likely had was going to be the outcome of, of the shutdowns of the schools. Um, it, it really pains me to think that our most vulnerable, those who are the most disadvantaged are at the most risk right now. Um, I, I feel so much because I have a sixth grader and I know what it's like the canvas, you know, transitioning to canvas. He was never used to canvas. And I, I have a lot of high expectations. So I guess it's interesting for me to listen to you all discuss all this. And maybe I should be a little bit, um, a little bit easier on him because I expect, you know, for him to, to do well, but it is a lot to go in between classes to figure out what, so, so one thing that we do every single week, and maybe this is something that could help other parents. And this is just advice, take it or leave it. What we do at the beginning of every single week is we make a, a weekly sort of calendar where we look at all of his individual classes to figure out what's due and we put them in by day because it's hard in Canvas when you have to go and click into individual courses to try to figure out what's due that week. And some teachers put it on the calendar and others don't. So just from an organizational perspective, what's worked for us is that we've been able to, and my son can just cross out what is due and what he's accomplished. And it's easy for me as a parent because then I could see what he has to finish and what he doesn't. Um, and we also do like quizzes and tests on a, a separate thing. A thing, another thing that I think would be helpful as far as Google meets is if they were sent through maybe calendar invites through, uh, Google, like, like Gmail, because I think what's happening is a lot of kids are trying to, um, figure out when they have Google meets. And if it was simply on a calendar where they could just take a look at their calendar on Google for that day, they could say, Oh, you know what? I have this Google meet. I don't have to click. Um, into all these places to find that. By the way, this is what I do for professionally is help people figure out technology and streamline these kind of things. Um, but, but as far as social and emotional, I really appreciate all the emphasis that we've been putting on this because the reality is, is that every single stakeholder right now is struggling. Parents, kids, teachers, we really all are. Um, and, and, and like I said, I, I think that it's great that we highlighted all of the strides that we've made, but it is in, in some ways also heartbreaking because I have the flexibility to be on with my son to answer his algebra questions. Thank goodness. I still know algebra, um, to help him <laughs> with these things. Um, but it's, it's challenge. It really is a challenge. And I think this is probably one of the most honest presentations that we've had thus far. And so for that, I really appreciate it. I really do. Um, and, and side note, you guys, delivery is excellent. You could tell that you're social emotional uh, experts. So, so thank you so much. I know it was a lot of information, but I really do appreciate it. Is there any other comments? Because I did want to say, Dr. Horner, 
I, I know it's already 930. If we could quickly go through the, the last E or F. Um, well, so we're we done. Moving along. We're, it's now up to committee reports. Superintendent's report is over. All right. All right. Thank you all for that information. Truly, um, everything from where we are. I mean, I, I just think about, you know, someone mentioned, and I'm going to stop after this, I promise. Um, I've mentioned to you, to some of you, my mother, so my mom was a single mom. Um, I haven't shared this with a lot of people, but she had three kids by the time she was 21 years old. So I was left at home a lot of times with my sisters. And so when you talk about siblings helping other siblings, I can totally relate to that. And I can totally relate to parents who are talking about, um, you know, really being stressed out about coming home from work, all those things. There's a lot of dynamics that are at play and that those are, that are in poverty, women, um, those who have learning disabilities are really the ones that ultimately are, are going to be struggling the most. So I appreciate the emphasis on that. Um, and, uh, and, and just from a personal standpoint, I, I can certainly understand how, how those things are affecting families. All right. I digress. So we're going to move on to the standing committee reports and Mr. Micucci, you're up with the finance committee report. I just want to take a minute to thank uh, the guidance counselors for that presentation. I, I, like you, it was uh, very enlightening on both sides to hear what's working well and, and where the opportunities were. So thank you very, very much. Uh, we had a very busy uh, finance meeting. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of uh, uh, glance through it uh, as quickly as I can. Um, we talked about the articles amendment uh, for the JOC that was voted on earlier. Um, we also had uh, uh, the uh, business office give us an update on the uh, budget timeline uh, and Act 1 uh, exceptions. Uh, we don't qualify at the present time for the Act 1 uh, exception, so we're going to uh, probably the next board meeting address this. Uh, from a budgetary standpoint, with then, with, which then elongates our, our budget process. Um, we heard a, uh, a, a five-year a five uh, forecast for our, our budget, um, which was actually a fairly positive. And I would uh, say to the board members, if you haven't gone in and looked, um, please do so. Uh, but I will highlight a couple things for the, for the, um, of the public. Uh, so this, this forecast takes us from our current budget year, 2020, 2021, our next budget year, all the way out to 2026. Um, and uh, if we stayed at uh, uh, Act 1 taxes, um, we would still, still show a fund balance somewhere in the neighborhood of $4.2 million, which is uh, a positive. Um, there are other uh, caveats to that. Uh, that may come into play in the future, um, but there is a, uh, uh, a healthy five-year projection. Uh, we looked at the forecast five uh, projections and uh, that's available to the entire uh, public. Uh, and what this is, is sort of a dashboard of, of how well we're doing. Uh, recognize that all our data is not entered. Uh, so it may show higher revenues than we're expecting. Uh, that leads me into the next point. We talked about expenditure, savings, and, and additional revenues. Um, our revenue is trending better uh, than was forecasted uh, by the administration earlier, uh, but we still remain uh, slightly behind last year. And of course, we won't know our final um, revenue until uh, the end of December. Um, so more to come on that. One thing that uh, we asked the administration for was you know, what's the number of folks that actually um, escrow their taxes? And, and we know it's somewhere around 80%, which is, a, which is nice to know from, a, from an overall uh, revenue standpoint. Uh, reviewed our operational goals uh, for the first quarter um, and had a, had a little, there's, a, there's an update on board docs that you guys can review. Um, and this is specifically around uh, um, some of the questions that we have uh, for the administration on a regular basis. Uh, so um, some other updates that I have uh, written down as far as our uh, food service budget. Um, so some statistics uh, 
Uh, last year, same time for the first several weeks of school, we get same time period as we're in now. Um, we uh, there was 44,000 uh, meals purchased. This year we're at 9,000. Um, so we have a strategy to to help with the budget, which is uh, um, not filling open vacancies, um, which is causing some stress to our uh, cafeteria folks, but uh, and food services folks. But nonetheless, it's something that we're trying to do to uh, understand how this trend is going to go. Um, again, it's just uh, more information uh, for you. The, we reviewed the NIDIC project uh, and uh, we're still looking really positive um, for the $1.6 million that, that are, that's left in contingency. Um, remember uh, for your awareness that, that this is capital money and can only be used on capital projects, um, but hopefully uh, this will take care of several capital, several years worth of capital um, projects and therefore uh, the money that we have allotted in the budget of a million dollars uh, won't need to be spent uh, uh, this year or next year uh, and possibly even the following year. Gave us an update on our grant funding and there's uh, some, some good documents in there. I do want to highlight that uh, we did receive a uh, $300,000 grant from the Bucks County IU to be used uh, towards uh, COVID um, and our administration is, is working on uh, uh, using that uh, monies as per the grant guidelines. Uh, we're in the process of our independent audit. It's currently taking place. Um, so we'll have some more information once this audit is completed, uh, but they're around doing that. We did have a brief uh, discussion on something called My School Bucks uh, software, uh, which is essentially an app um, that people can pay for things uh, out of pocket that they would normally exchange uh, cash for. Uh, such as AP testing, class trips, uh, clubs, uh, and student fees. Um, this will be something we're going to do on a trial basis, uh, and uh, it, it hopefully will make things easier on on all fronts. The administration, who's who's in charge of collecting it, and and parents that are in charge of paying for things, or students that are in charge of paying for things. There's one caveat to this. Uh, there is a 3.5% um, service fee associated with it. So. This is not mandatory right now. We're going to give it a try, um, but uh, hopefully it's something that uh, uh, we show is, is beneficial. Uh, let me see what else I got here. Um, oh, and our charter schools, last but not least. So our charter schools, uh, we've, we've increased uh, by since the last presentation by three to four students. Uh, and we're running about $1.3 million above what we uh, projected. So remember, this is a fluid number. Um, this number changes as people enter uh, charter schools and uh, come out of charter schools. So it's a monthly charge. So uh, the $1.3 million is probably worst case scenario for everybody. Um, one of the things that we asked was, you know, where, where are students going to? And right now it seems to be cyber charter. Uh, I, do, I, I do wanna just, say that there is a lot of really good information, um, stuff that we've asked for um, uh, in goals and, and uh, specifically around uh, strategies to mitigate expenses. Um, and that's located in board docs. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I'll highlight for you that the domain five of the superintendent's goals, uh, topic six was report monthly uh, changes resulting in uh, expenditure savings. And so there's a, a really nice, simple to read uh, document there um, for everybody. Zach, did I miss anything? I think you covered all of it. John, are you happy with the, the presentation? Ron? Looks good to me. All right, Chris, do you have any questions? Don't, don't, don't do that. I was in the meeting, remember? <laughs> I just wanted to Can give you an opportunity. Keith? No, no. No, Keith. <laughs> Chris, he was stand kidding. down. Stand down. No I'm kidding. All right. Thank you. Um, That's all I got. Ironically enough, next up, Mr. Spear with your facilities committee report. We did not meet. That's In quick. Report? Oh, that is a record. Keith has a question. <laughs> None. 
I'm going to move on to our Bucks County Intermediate Unit, Mr. Jackson, and you also have that following the legislative report and the QCF. Yeah, I want to, I want to apologize for not posting the uh, minutes from the uh, um, IU meeting. We had the IU meeting just a couple of days ago. And as we are welcoming, welcoming back our Dr. Hoffman, we welcome back Dr. Hoffman at the IU meeting as well. Um, there's always a lot of awesome news to talk about uh, with the IU. I'll, I'll simply say that, remember, we use our IU, most people think of it as a special deeds arm of our district, although we certainly do provide a lot of those services through our own staff. Um, but we also, the IU also provides all kinds of uh, educational outreaches to uh, pre-K kids, as well as adults, as well as teachers, as well as everyday students. So there's a lot of services that the IU provides. Uh, and I apologize for not having that uh, available to you this week. Um, so ends that report and I'll move on to the legislative report. The legislative report is posted. I appreciate that being uploaded. Uh, I will not go into detail about that. Everybody's focus pretty much right now is focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is a national uh, series of elections. And that's all I'll say about that topic. Uh, moving on to the Ed Foundation. For the, yes, the Ed Foundation um, president, Dr. Bill, or Mr. Bill Tuszynski, uh I'm not sure, he's, he's a, have made a pre couple of presentations in front of this board before. Uh, Dr. Harner knows him well. Uh, Bill has stepped down as president. He's still on the board. Um, Stephanie Nikowski has taken up that mantle. Uh, for those of you who've been around district activities for some time, she has been on a number of committees. I know that uh, Ms. Edwards knows her well. I'm sure she's, I would trust that she's fond of Ms. Nikowski. She's gonna lead the Ed Foundation going forward. It's been difficult for the Ed Foundation to um, give any grants out to the teachers. Uh, teachers are overwhelmed now. We all know that and we appreciate their work. Uh, there's not a lot of time to consider innovative ways to teach in this, uh, the current situation we're under. So um, the Ed Foundation is not exactly making a big push to get out, get those dollars out there right now. Uh, they're certainly always available, uh, but we haven't begun trying to find ways to spend the money we have only because we're in such a flux of an educational system at the moment. And um, uh, we're not, we're just trying to let the district do its job and let everybody know we're here if they need us, so to speak. So, uh, so ends the Ed Foundation report. Um, uh, just out of habit, I wanna say we did we, last Wednesday, not just uh, yesterday, but a week ago Wednesday. So, uh, so ends my reports, Madam President. Thank you. What do you call what do you call a vice president? Mr. Vice President? <laughs> doesn't sound doesn't sound quite as like sophisticated, madam. Just like yo bub. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right, we're gonna move on to the Upper Bucks County Technical School. Mr. Akmanowitz. Uh, the last JOC meeting was October 15th, 2020. It was held in person for the JOC board members and administration. Uh, publicly available for the community to participate and to view. Uh, we conducted routine business, hiring, approved leaves, uh, did a tour of the outbuilding that the Ag Tech is based out of. It's nearly complete. Uh, congratulations to Madison and Coffee from Penridge, uh, your selection as student of the month at the Upper Bucks County Technical School should make your district proud. Uh, we made minor adjustments to the subcommittee assignments um, policy updates as per the recommendation of the administration. Uh, we approved uh, some minor change orders to the Ag Tech building and approved salary adjustments and OAC appointments. The next meeting of the Upper Bucks County Technical School is November 19th, 2020. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, sir. I'm gonna move on to the president's report. I have a couple items uh, before I get to those items. I did want to bring up the live streaming. I think that's something that we did talk about earlier on in the meeting and I'll open this up to the board, but um, one thing I think we negotiated earlier on in, in the school year is that we were not going to mandate that there were any live streaming. 
I'm a little bit concerned that I'm hearing there's a lack of consistency in terms of what is some teachers live streaming and others that are not offering those opportunities. So I just wanted to open that up to the board to see your thoughts on that. Do you know? What are the uh, issues, um, Dr. Hoff? I mean, I guess I, I want to throw it to you since this is more of a a um, curriculum kind of a thing. I know there's some issues with the ability to live stream versus, um, or maybe Nancy Nancy Ann can answer too. Teachers' concerns about live streaming. There are various concerns. I don't need to list them. Uh, I'm sure the administration knows what they are. Um, I, I, we we would all love to see every child have the ability to um, tune in live, so to speak, if a teacher's teaching in front of a class as if they were there at the class. I'm sure that opens up a host of issues. Uh, how do you know if one kid's raising their hand if they're virtual? How do you lean over their shoulder and instruct them if they're virtual? Um, if you're paying attention to them virtually or are you ignoring the other kids in the class? There's a, there, a thousand questions pop into all of our mind. Um, are you suggesting, uh, Kaylin, that you're, you want to see more teachers offer the live stream or are you just raising the question in general? And I'd like the administration to talk about what the issues are from their standpoint and from the, from the staff standpoint that would hinder us from doing so. Can we get an explanation, you know, uh, between live streaming and synchronous education too? Because I think those two terms are thrown out a lot and, and I'm not sure that they're necessarily the same. And before that gets addressed, I, I think the bottom line of what I'm saying is there are some teachers who are providing, um, when I say live instruction, what I mean is they are providing instruction in a classroom and they turn on their camera and um, they're teaching their class as if they're just doing ordinary instruction and their kids from home that are actually tuning in. It doesn't mean that they necessarily interrupt the lesson to address those virtual students right at that moment. It just means that they're given instruction and maybe they do provide opportunities for those virtual students. But what I'm hearing is occurring is that there are some students who show up to a classroom and the teacher, even if they're there on their days where they're supposed to be receiving live instruction, that they're not actually receiving that live instruction, that they're expected to read from a book and complete activities on their own. And that's not consistent across, uh, it's the, I think there's a lack of expectation maybe that we can own on that because we didn't want to put the pressure on teachers that they were forced to do that. But what I think is important to take away here is that there is a lack of consistency in terms of what we're offering for instruction on both the days that kids are in school and the days that they're at home. It sounds to me, and maybe I'm confused, but that sounds to me like you're talking about two different things. So you're talking about a consistency of modality of, of how instruction is being delivered, not necessarily live streaming. Uh, am, am I missing something there? I'm not sure I understand the question. So you're talking about when students are in, in the classroom or, or, or being instructed, they're being given book I'm talking about both, actually. I'm talking about both. There seems to be a lack of consistency. Um, thanks for the clarifying question. There seems to be a lack of consistency between kids who are in the classroom and the instructional model, as well as the live streaming that is occurring while kids are in the classroom and the kids virtually are learning. Some teachers are providing that opportunity, some are not. So some people are having a really great experience because they're having their teacher provide all these opportunities. And then others are having very few of those opportunities. And then you have a separate situation where kids are coming into a classroom and they're um, not receiving live instruction as much as they're, and I'm not saying this represents the majority, 
I'm just trying to get some expect like expectations and consistency. Hopefully that makes sense. I think I know what you meant, Kaylin, that, that some, uh, I saw we, we, we've gotten some messages from parents that were talking about um, some of their in-class kids even are just going into their class, opening their laptop and working off Canvas just as though they were at home. And the teacher's essentially standing in front of the classroom, you know, there to help them if they need it, but they're essentially doing the exact same work they would have been doing had they been at home. And then they're, the kids at home in some classes are getting these great experiences where the teachers, like you said, are turning on the camera and doing, I, I guess I would call it, and that's why I asked for clarification, like synchronous education that the teacher in the classroom is teaching the kids at home and in the classroom at the exact same time. And they're all following along together. So I, I think that those are the questions you had asked. I'm not sure of the terminology, like I said, between synchronous and uh, live, live classrooms, because I, I think that there's two different ways those things are explained. That, that, that did capture it. Can we respond? Please. Okay, great. First off, the definition of synchronous versus ace, um, versus live streaming. Um, Dr. Hoffman, if you would take that. Sure, and in a lot of ways it's, it's nuanced in, in the way that the terms are used and they are often used interchangeably, but for the purposes of school, the synchronous instruction really just means that students are participating at the same time in the same um, manner uh, to the best of our ability. So that would be where the teacher is teaching live in front of the class and students at home are somehow connected to that class, watching it in real time um, and, and connected at that exact time. And then we think of live streaming um, as a way for that to happen in a synchronous model, but then also be saved and shared later on. So maybe in that case, a teacher records their lesson as it's going on and then they post it later in the day for um, a student student to watch it, um, which some of our teachers are doing. Um, and I know that there has been some comments about that being difficult because it's not being posted until later in the day and things like that. Um, but that's sort of the, the best way to describe the, the two. They're very similar in most ways, but typically we think of the live stream as being available later on in the day and synchronous being something you have to do right at the same time. Well, to, then to, frame, to frame the conversation, um, Ms. Edwards, you out there? There you go. If would you kind of um, characterize the conversation we had um, back with uh, you know, with Ryan and live streaming and what we agreed that it would be and what the expectations were? Well, we we said that the expectation was to provide synchronous opportunities. We did not mandate that teachers that every teacher live stream. And I think what we're seeing happening in many places, at least from conversations with, um, with principals, is that as more teachers are trying live streaming and seeing the ways in which that helps streamline the preparation piece and, and providing a more similar experience to the students that are live in front of them and the students that are uh, virtual on that day, that we're seeing an increasing number of teachers becoming comfortable with using live streaming as their synchronous strategy. Um, so part of the problem I think is in the process of solving itself. Um, but Ryan did have a significant concern about mandating live streaming for every teacher. And so we did not mandate it for every, um, for every teacher. Well, well um, Joe, if you would unmute Mr. So, v. So to, to, to follow that up, then, then the answer is yes, kids are getting a different experience. Yes. That is, and that's my main concern is kids are not getting the same experience. There's, a, there's another issue too that, need, that would need to be addressed if you were going to try and push for all teachers to go to some form of live streaming, synchronous live streaming, and that's the technical students. 
because of if it was a standard year or standard school year where we had long classes, everybody was on the same block schedule, the same time periods, it wouldn't be a problem. But the way the period for the tech school are structured, there's no way the tech students will be able to tune in to some of their live classes when those classes are going live. They will either be at the tech school in transition or something like that. So it'll simply be absolutely impossible for those students to get the same type of education that the other students are gonna be receiving who aren't tech related. I'm just pointing that out. But couldn't it be- so that If there's this variation that, that's occurring, I guess my question you know, is then how are you, how are you going to guarantee the, 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 the parents that their students are gonna get? I mean, we just had a report on you know, some concerning data on ELA and mathematics. If there's no consistency in the, the, the model of delivery, um, are we going to expect one group to outperform the other? I mean, is that, is that like, uh, it's a very, do we, have any, do we have any data that would support anything that we've done being superior? or inferior to something? In other words, what one model the teacher's doing versus another model to say, I mean, that may be a question you look at it as far as your data is concerned to, to start really putting some, some teeth around what we're talking about. I guess what we're trying to ask is how, what does the, the administration recommend in terms of consistency? How can we make the learning experience more consistent? And I would have liked, first off, they be providing the virtual students the, a consistent um, opportunity from one teacher to the other is just like the 100% of our teach, 100% uh, of our students are back in the classroom from one teacher teaching English one to another teacher teaching English one, the experience are, are, is t could be totally different because of instructional styles, learning styles in a classroom. So it's never been consistent ever before because one teacher does it one way, one teacher does it another way. Now, that doesn't answer the question about live streaming. We have it a lot of- doesn't answer the question about Actually, delivery. Think, it, 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 it talks it, it, about the styles being different. But it I doesn't think it talk does about delivery mode. I think it does sort of answer that question about live streaming. I mean, live streaming is a tool for, for delivering synchronously. And, and like have, you said, each teacher is going to have their different style. So if if one teacher is comfortable with live streaming and another isn't, that doesn't mean that because their styles are different, one is necessarily better than the other. Um, teach, but my, I'm sorry, Dr. Hunter. Go ahead. You, uh, I'm sorry, sir. Um, but my question was going to be about students. I I know my daughter uh, in second grade, she has the option of going to the synchronous opportunities. Um, if, Kaylin, if what you're saying is uh, a concern, then wouldn't we have to also mandate that students would be uh, required to attend these synchronous uh, opportunities, live streaming, whatever you want the teachers are using in order to get towards that, that uh, goal of uh, a more uniform model? Not necessarily. What some of my kids' teachers are doing is recording that lesson that they're doing synchronously, and they're posting it later for their students that are virtual. So and that act, I'm, I'm sorry, that actually I'm eliminates becoming... though the time, right? So you have to provide, in my opinion, either a synchronous opportunity or a later like some kind of video that is recorded. But then it becomes the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, so the, the value, and, and maybe Dr. Hoffman can, can talk to this, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, the value of a synchronous opportunity is the ability for the student at home uh, or in the classroom to interact with the teacher one-to-one -one, uh, in real time. I think people just want some kind of instruction and not have to teach themselves. I mean, I, and I'm not trying to say this to disrespect teachers, but because a lot of them are doing a phenomenal job. But some kids are teaching themselves at home or and, in the classroom. They come into the classroom. We've gotten emails. You've read them. 
where they right. flip open their Chromebook. And I'm not and denying that, but what I'm saying is in your model, the one you just outlined where they're recording the, the uh, synchronous opportunity and then playing it back later, that's creating a synchronous model where they're teaching themselves. No, I'm, I, I'm my, let's talk about the end goal and work our way backwards. The end goal is for our kids to receive some type of instruction rather than having to read from a book and do activity. So if they're getting such a small amount of actual instruction, if every kid could learn just from reading a book, we wouldn't have a public education model, right? So well, see, then you're talking about two different things. You're not talking about synchronous uh, or live streaming. You're talking about the, the method in which things are being delivered. Okay, then, so then I can see to that. And I, I'm, what I'm saying is that, that it's not consistent. That's simply what I'm saying. And we, we have seen that over time, we were receiving a lot of emails from parents saying, I'm so excited that, you know, my child is now receiving more instruction, whether that be synchronous, whether that be video, whatever it is, is that they're, they're getting more engagement and they're actually learning. And I, I just want us to ask the administration that they be more consistent on that. I didn't mean... And don't get me wrong, I, I'm all for more synchronous opportunities, which is what I think you're trying to say. I'm just trying to get to the root of what you're- The root of what I'm trying about. to say is that um, the kids need instruction and they can't right. be expected to learn on and, their and that's own. Where I'm, and that's where I'm kind of going with this, because if we're offering more synchronous opportunities, which we have asked them to do, the teachers, we've asked the teachers to do, to offer these opportunities, I think then we also have to mandate that uh, students attend these as part of their attendance feature. Um, because well, if we're offering these, then then the onus is on the teachers to deliver, but the the students should be responsible for being in those in those synchronous. I'm programs. fine with asynchronous opportunities and for parents who may work a, a night schedule who can't be present with their kids or or whatever. I want flexibility, but what I'm asking for is consistency. So I, I it's not, it's, it's becoming a Brian versus Kaylin debate at this point, And we probably should move on. <laughs> Kaylin, I'm not debating. I'm trying to understand what you're asking and trying to make it so that I can formulate in my head what you're trying to get at. So I'm not, I, I have that. explained it a number of times, but I'm sorry. I didn't understand. May I share? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've had this conversation with a couple of you. I've had this conversation with several parents um you've received emails um with with constructive criticism from parents um we've had uh, extensive conversations within the administration and and with with, with teachers um uh, this week a faculty meeting at the high school the whole topic was about um engagement with students were or at least the majority of the topics were about this kind of thing matt you're on you're unmuted here i think if you could, if you would briefly share what we were working on, but I would like to, to share, we're, we're just what week six of our work. Um, this is a totally new requirement and expectation of teachers. And some have been incredible from the very beginning. And some of our incredible teachers weren't didn't want to use or are uncomfortable using the technology. As I've walked the halls talking to teachers, they've shared with me that, you know, I didn't do it this way, but now I'm doing it that way. I went into Frank Parker's band room. He's got three cameras in, in the room. So the, the students at home can play along and, and then provide criticism back of what they're hearing and all kinds of feedback. Other teachers flip, flip the switch right at the beginning of the class period and expect their students to be sitting there in front of the camera doing the work. And as you know, Brian, it, it, or I guess you have a first and, uh, first and second grader or a kindergartner and first grader, uh, it, in our third, fourth and fifth grades, you know, a lot of our teachers turn the cameras on in the beginning of the school day and turn it off at the end of the school day. That's not, it, that, that is not what there is going on in a lot of our primary years programs. But Matt, would you had this as a topic of her faculty meeting about improvement and 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 better engagement because teachers are 
are doing a lot of work and, and, and I think we're not nipping it all in the bud to, to be perfect, but we're getting there. And I'd like to share a little bit of what Matt had shared with me about what he learned this week and what he was doing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Horner. Um, a couple of comments. I, I don't want to call it necessarily improvement because I wanted to call it a direct change in direction. Uh, it's not necessarily that I want to create the impression that teachers aren't doing what they're do, uh, doing the right thing because they certainly are. Um, but we are looking at opening the school and having uh, a different set of, uh, of, of, of parameters and expectations for, 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 for instruction. And as we move on, we learn and we continue to learn. Uh, and my, 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 um, charge to the teachers was let's get better, uh, a little bit better every day. Um, and so um, as we're doing that, I do see more and more uh, need for, for, for live instruction. And, and I will mirror um, uh, Mr. Reimer's comment that, that I think that um, it, it would have to come with some sort of an expectation that students will be live as well. Um, as far as the data is concerned, and, 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 and I know Mr. Makuchi was touching on the data, we are noticing that a lot of our struggles are with the students who are currently virtual. They are struggling. Uh, you are absolutely correct. And, and, and what are we going to do about it? Uh, the difficulty I'm having uh, with that data is, is not necessarily the hard data, but the interpretation of that data. Um, what, what I'm struggling with is who are the students that are virtual? Um, and, and what I am seeing currently is that we are having a very difficult time with uh, motivating those students who are in a uh, virtual environment. Uh, motivation seems to be key. Uh, mental health is another one, what we just talked about. Uh, and third, uh, what Mr. Detweiler was saying, we are seeing an increased number of students who are virtual that are currently working full-time jobs, 30, 40 hours a week. Um, that those are all difficulties that we're facing right now. Um, and difficulties with the synchronous learning. Um, as far as the data is, I do see a, a higher number of students who are currently hybrid in our AP and honors classes than I see in our uh, CP classes. Um, so uh, drawing a conclusion, and I don't wanna to speak to individuals, but, but more as a general sense is that our, our higher performing students are in the hybrid situation, in the hybrid model. Uh, they are uh, attending classes more in person um, uh, than uh, our other, the rest of our population. And so are the students who are now virtual uh, not necessarily our highest performing students always. And so would those students have performed better if they were in, a, in an in-person situation than they are hybrid or is it because they are virtual? It's, it's a very difficult uh, question for me to answer um, in, in this model. Um, I will say that um, in my conversations, I, I see a lot more student, uh, more and more teachers uh, doing the um, uh, synchronous learning. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Um, I will encourage it every time that I'm in the classroom. I'm, I encourage everybody to do it. Uh, in my conversations with teachers, also I notice that uh, some teachers say, "Hey, um, I'm doing my lessons completely virtual, uh, completely live and synchronous, um, and, and I'm very happy if one or two students log on to that." Uh, live instruction. And so some teachers get discouraged by that. Um, you know, we offer this to our students and to, um, you know, Mr. Jackson's uh, 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 comments earlier, they're very valid. Some of our tech students are not able to do that because they have to be in two places at the same time. And so they do have to access that at a later time. Uh, we also noticed that we have students uh, in the high school that are that are taking care of uh, some of their elementary school age siblings at home. And so they might have to work with them on their education and then log on to our uh, schooling or our uh, offerings uh, asynchronously because they do not have the opportunity to follow that live. Um, uh, and then the students who are working full time jobs that are uh, sometimes not logging on until 8 or 9 p.m. because that's the time that they are able to do that. Um, it's a difficult time for everyone. Um, yes, I believe uh, very true that uh, we do need to offer at this time uh, more synchronous instruction. Uh, I don't see it as uh, an improvement. I see it as a change uh, in our in our approach, uh, making it a mandate as opposed to making it an option. Um, but I do think there needs to be an expectation for students as well to log on to that. Um, having said that, uh, I think that uh, it is wise for us to allow for some form of opt out to that 
uh, for those students who have extenuating circumstances who are not able to uh, meet that uh, synchronous expectation because um, as I've heard before from the board as well, uh, it is a difficult time for our families as well. And I wanna keep that in mind uh, that some of our students are uh, experiencing additional pressures at home uh, based on the circumstances that they're facing uh, as a family. And those are difficult times that I want to uh, recognize. Um, but but uh, having said that, I think our teachers are doing a phenomenal job. Um, I think some redirecting of, of how we're doing that job is appropriate, especially now that we're switching back to a live model on November 18th. And I think that's a great opportunity. Uh, right now we are seeing that uh, the majority of our students, three maybe out of five days uh, are at home in the hybrid model. Uh, and so the majority of the time they spend at home versus with us, and we're going to shift gears to seeing the majority of the students in front of us. And I think this is a good opportunity to kind of rethink what we're doing. Uh, and does it still make sense to continue doing what we're doing? Or does it make sense to offer more synchronous instruction? So that will be my recommendation to, to add more synchronous uh, uh, instruction uh, live uh, live instruction, um, but I do believe that 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 some sort of expectation for students um, needs to be connected with that in order to make it beneficial for all. That's very helpful. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Hard times for everyone. It's hard time. It's hard for teachers to adjust to this new instructional model, especially if they've never had to utilize technology before. Um, that that is a big learning curve. So, well, I think. Me, go ahead. Sorry, Jalen. I just want to ask one, Matt, one one question. So, so is the expectation, and we we talked a lot about the synchronous, and we talked a lot about the live feeds, but is the expectation clear as far as when they are in class, are they receiving live instruction, or is the expectation that the kids come in, and because of the model we set up they're asked to open up a computer and read or watch a video. The what, current, what, what is the expectation so, so that the parents know? The current expectation is that students will, or teachers will provide live synchronous opportunities for students. Um, not necessarily live synchronous instruction of the lesson at all times. The instruction could be provided in a different form, but there should be opportunities for students that they have access to synchronous opportunities. Uh, that could be a lab in the science class, that could be a demonstration in another class, that could be a, a, a question and answer session, that could also be instruction. And so, yes, there is a variety of ways that a teacher can provide that. Um, having said that, on Wednesdays, there is the expectations for students to be live with uh, for teachers to be live with students for 15 minutes per class. Uh, that's for the Wednesdays. Um, and so uh, there is a live synchronous opportunity expectation, but not necessarily the recording of a lesson at the moment. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Matt. I think that the, the point is clear that we're really working toward more synchronous opportunities and that's what, what is best for kids. So thank you for, for your leadership on that. Um, I'm gonna talk about the appointment of a transportation committee as well as a appointment of QCA, excuse me, QCEA negotiation committee. And Zach, do I need to have, or Dr. Harner, do we need to have names for that if we're gonna appoint that at this time? Yes, so you need to have names. Any takers? I, I'm willing to um, to be on one of the two committees. I'm I'm okay with that. Other board members. I'm willing to be I'm on the negotiations committee. That's, I, yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, Kaylin, I, As far as I, it, I, I would I would like to see since the H maybe I'm partial, but since the HR committee already exists, I kind of figured that would be the default committee for the negotiations as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be, um, but I kind of it seems like it makes be. sense. Isn't that what historically what that committee is for? I would think so. Yeah. So, I mean, that is me and Jen. And uh, who was the third member? Mr. Kern, was it? Or was it somebody else? Well, David. Dave came to quite a few of those. Oh, anybody can come. But again, the committee is three specific members. It is. Actually, actually I, I was going to correct me if I'm wrong, actually, it, with, with, with regards to a negotiation committee, though, I believe that is limited to those three. You don't want to pull in the full board 
uh, outside of the three members of the negotiating team, Dr. Harner, Nancy, and even you know, Zach, I should say, correct me if I'm wrong about that, we want to limit it to just the three members of that committee if we're going to be going through negotiations. Yeah, unlike other committees, this is not a public meeting um, committee that meets publicly. So you, you want to typically limit it to, to three, maybe one alternate. Well, Ron and I did the um, participated in the negotiations with the um, the the and staff, I guess it was I, yeah, guess, I guess Dave so. was I guess Dave was the third member, right? Uh, yeah, Dave Dave was the third member. Are yeah, you there, Dave? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm here. I'm definitely listening. Yeah, I was definitely the third member. Um, yeah. So do we just want to keep it that way on the negotiating committee? As long as all the members of that committee are fine with it, I'm good with it. When when were we looking to get started? It's not until January, but we'd have to have some pre. Zach, you want to speak to the time time frame? As long as it's after December fifteenth, I'm fine with it. So, so <laughs> by law, we have to have our first meeting by January tenth. I would recommend we try to get one in before leaving for the Christmas break. Just a short meeting, just to meet our legal obligation. Um, we would want to meet as a committee and administration team, probably once or twice before that. Um, it's likely going to be more. Um, of a time commitment than, than the QUESPA negotiating process, I would, yeah. I would venture to guess. Yeah, Dave, we would need to be, we would need to meet before the break simply to like brainstorm important uh, issues from the administrative standpoint. I, so, I don't yeah. think like a one-off meeting should be a big deal prior to, to the 1st of January or even two, of course, um, but anything that's gonna be uh, intense and, and require a lot of hours, I. I'm working 12 hour days, four days a week and uh, no nine hour days the other day. So um, I, I don't have any weekdays or nights, unfortunately, until after December 15th at this time. Yes. All right. Sounds like that would work. So then I guess we just need to solve for the transportation committee. Um, do we have a number on that that we'd like to have in that committee? Is that about three? It's the same. Correct. And I, I, I would think this committee would only meet three or four times. So I'll go ahead and appoint myself on that committee. Um, do I have two others that would be interested in being um, on that committee? If you would like. Okay, Mr. Klein. As well. Yep. Mr. Reimers, is that, did you say you'd like to be on that committee? Sure. Great. That was it's a lot wrong. easier than I thought. Such cooperation, school board. Yay. Nice job, everyone. <laughs> All right, well then with that, I'm gonna move on to the fiscal consent agenda, or sorry, sorry, the fiscal agenda. On that agenda, we have the general obligation bonds. Um, that's a series of 2021 parameters resolution. And that'll Mrs. be- Mrs. Mitchell, roll. each one of those needs to be a separate vote. And that those are all roll call, correct? Correct. All right, so then we'll start with the first one. And so I'll need a motion to authorize the issuance of general obligation bonds for the purpose of refunding the general obligation bond series 2013, series A of 2013, series of 2014, 2016, series A of 2016 as prepared by the bond council. So moved. I'll second. Discussion. So this is what came out of the, um, the um, recommendations to essentially save us some money by reissuing these bonds, right, Zach? Correct, if you remember last meeting, uh, you voted to authorize the administration to work with PFM and bond council to get the parameters resolutions done. Now you actually have to vote on the official parameters resolutions. So it's just the next step of, of what you already gave us the direction to, to do. Okay, I was just making sure it wasn't something new. No, it's not something new. And, and Jamie Doyle from PFM is here in case there were any specific questions. Um, Poor thing, had to listen to this whole meeting. <laughs> All right, any other discussion on that or questions? All right, Anita, go ahead and with the roll call. So the motion is to authorize the issuance of general obligation bonds series 2021 for the purpose of the refunding of general obligation bonds series 2013, series A of 2013, series of 2014, series of 2016, and Series A of 2016 as prepared by Bond Council. Mr. Kern. 
Yes. Mr. Akmanowitz. Yes. Ms. Weed. Yes. Mr. Micucci. Yes. Mr. Reimers. Yes. Mr. Spear. Yes. Mr. Klein. Yes. Mr. Jackson. Yes. Mrs. Mitchell. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And the next one is a motion to authorize the issuance of general obligation bond series A of 2021 for the purpose of refunding the general obligation bonds series AAA of 2016 as prepared by bond council. I'll need a motion. So move, Mr. Klein. Second, Mr. Jackson. Discussion. Go ahead with the roll call, Anita, please. Motion to authorize the issuance of general obligation bonds series A of 2021 for the purpose of refunding the general obligation bonds series AAA of 2016 as prepared by bond council. Mr. Kern. Yes. Mr. Rachmanowitz. Yes. Ms. Weed. Yes. Mr. Micucci. Yes. Mr. Reimers. Yes. Mr. Spear. Yes. Mr. Klein. Yes. Mr. Jackson. Yes. Mrs. Mitchell. Yes. Motion passes unanimously again. Thank you. Next item is a motion to approve uh, the September 2020 Boucher and James bill list as presented. I'll need a motion. So moved, Mr. Kern. Second, Mr. Klein. Discussion. Nighting related um, bills, charges. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed or abstention? Abstention, please. Mr. Jackson. Motion carries with one abstention. F Next is the fiscal consent agenda. We have the approval of um, the agreement between the BCIU to issue annual homestead farmstead notices, a contract with the Upper Bucks YMCA, approval of the June budget transfers, approval of the preliminary June 2020 treasurer's report, approval of the September 2020 treasurer's report and approval of the September 2020 bill list. I'll need a motion on those items. So moved. I'll second. Discussion. A real quick thing about these, um, the IU uh, issuing these farmstead agreements. Uh, how many of those do they have to issue? One for every taxpayer in our district or just qualifying ones? Like I see it's, you know, 69 cents per partial. Per parcel is what it costs us, but do, is that sent to every parcel or? Every qualifying parcel they'll send it to. They do it on behalf of all the districts in, in Bucks County. Okay. Other discussion or questions? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to the uh, facilities consent agenda. I'll need a motion to approve the 2020 capital improvement plan per attached authorizing the administration to go out for bid or utilize cooperative bidding. Can I get a motion, please? So move, Mr. Jackson. I'll second. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Next is our human resources consent agenda. On that, we have administrative staff, professional staff, support staff, and unit pay. There's some various items in there. So I'll need a motion to approve those. So move, Mr. Klein. I'll second, Mr. Reimers. 
discussion. Can I, raise, can I raise an issue that may not be on this agenda per se, but is part of the budgeting and thinking of this agenda? I want to revisit the nurses thing again. Um, I'm not sure if Ms. Ballone is still on the uh, uh, meeting, but um, to what extent are we trying to hire again nurses to fill this floating thing that the, the, the team of nurses has requested? Or what are we doing to lighten the load of our nurses? Can we speak to that again? So that we could perhaps address that in the future staffing thing. I'm just just want to remind everybody what that is. May I recommend we bring that back at the next meeting? If you so choose. If it would be better, that's perfect. Thank you. Fair enough. Any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. And that motion carries unanimously. Next is the Office of Teaching and Learning Consent Agenda. We have the approval of MOU between QCSC and Head Start. And so I'll need a motion to vote on that item. So moved, Mr. Akmanowicz. I'll second, Mr. Ramers. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, moving on to the policy and programs consent agenda. We have a settlement agreement and release for student number 22256, as well as the appointment of an appeal decision maker. So I'll need a motion on that of those items. So moved, Mr. Klein. Second, Mr. Kern. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Is there aye. anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next is um, some information items that we have. And those include the Pennsylvania Department of Health policy on testing, isolation, and quarantining. We have a budget calendar. We have survey results that we took from parents to report to us on their experience with back to school. And I highly recommend that the board members and the community take a moment to look through those. It's some very good information. We also have substitute teacher recruitment strategies. We're really trying hard. If you know someone that is interested, we did recently increase the rate. So we are, we're <clears throat> always looking for subs and that's a challenge for us in, in terms of a daily basis trying to to cover down um i don't believe we have any communication items so we're going to move on to new business is there any new business um may i go ahead so i just uh made some notes from the meeting and i had saved a few of them a few four other board members had touched on a few of them the full-time float nurse thing I'd, I'd like to make sure that we we definitely circle back around on that uh, so i went ahead and crossed it off um, the, uh, open up and open comments, um, from the public and rather than having a third party read them off, I, I find that there is some merit to that request. Um, as an, if I was approaching this as an outsider, I would probably feel exactly the same way as the individual who wrote to us, um, who did not get to read that comment themselves, uh, ironically. Um, and I think that we really need to do something if we're going to keep meeting this way uh, to allow individuals, they, they can write in and it could be read off, but if they want to make them state that statement within a minute and a half or two minutes on themselves, I believe that we should offer them the opportunity. Um, so hopefully uh, this body uh, can, you know, make that happen in future meetings. Um, and finally, uh, I just want to remind everybody, the Central Bucks Chamber of Commerce uh, has a, an award for uh, young students for college. It's a scholarship. Um, it's right on their website. Um, the deadline I believe is in two or three days uh, for you to nominate a student who's done something of uh, excellence, uh, community service, some service uh, based um, um, history uh, to them. Uh, they might be a good candidate for that scholarship. And I just want to encourage anybody who uh, may have a really diligent student um, 
we might want to nominate them for that award. They can find that information on the website, and that's it. Sure, you um, you shared that email with us, and we'll I Gary, Gary, Gary will get something out there on Facebook and cool. and tweet it out. So we'll get that information out. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Joe, is there a way that if somebody as a participant raises their hand, we could um, bring them over to allow them to make comments from being participants instead of panelists? <clears throat> um, it, it's possible. I would suggest if we do that, that we have that um, that public comment be submitted like we're doing it now and just have the list of people already in order. I think hand raising during a meeting is gonna get very chaotic to try to manage. So I, I, I would concede for something like that. If they submit a comment in advance and they wanna make the comment themselves, I'd be okay with that. Yeah, I really like the idea. I think that if we're gonna continue meeting like this to your point, Dave, that we should take a look at continuing um, to allow people to have a voice and a way that they can express that. So I like that idea. I do too. I wanted to echo what Dave was saying and thank Dave for bringing it up. I really do. Um, but I had another question if I can. Sure. Um, so I personally think it would be beneficial. We're, we're going into a point now where we're, we're mandating some changes to the number of students that are coming back, the, the instructional models, uh, that we're going to be asking for teachers uh, to do. And we're changing, I don't want to say the recommendations, but the expect, the, how we're, we're asking them to increase their, their synchronous learning, uh, as Matt had said. Uh, would it be beneficial to get a, a, an idea from the teachers how they're feeling uh, now, as opposed to what we did in, I think it was August, when we, we talked to them and, and got their feedback? Uh, in some kind of a survey or something just to see, you know, then for example, when we were talking with them about uh, the cameras, they said, I think it was like 4% uh, were willing to do the, uh, the live streaming. Has that changed uh, now as they've become more comfortable with these models? You know, it's just, a, I think, a way of getting more data to, to see how the teachers are. Dr. Harner, do you want to address that? Sir, you're, so you're asking for us to create a survey um, of our teachers on where they are with a whole, across the whole spectrum of, from instruction to day-to-day to, -day to well-being and all that. Uh, in, in a way, that's what I was thinking. I don't know if that's practical, and, and I was asking for opinions uh, more than than anything. Maybe what we could ask is how comfortable people, teachers feel, and the current way that they're uh, providing these opportunities and whether or not they need additional support um, or maybe the barriers that they're facing in order to achieve it. Does that sound like what you're thinking? Yeah, I think it's really coming down to, you know, we're, we're making all these changes and we're doing it a lot without a whole lot of feedback from the teachers. Um, I think I would like to hear some teacher perspective in these conversations as we're going through uh, that we're not right now. Primarily the, the elementary I think teachers have had the, have had the changes. So do we want to if we were to do this, do we want to wait until after those changes happened in the secondary or only poll the elementary teachers at this point? Because they're the um, only ones that have really undergone and the changes. The, the secondary are still doing the same as they were when the year started. And I'm sorry, Keith, you, you can go ahead then. <laughs> to my answer to you, Chris, is I, I really don't know. I don't know what the answer is uh, for that. Go ahead, Keith. I mean, I, I, I do agree that, that teacher input is, is super valuable. Um, but our, our job is the governance. It's, it's really the administration's job to, to really get their, their fingers on the pulse. And so, I don't know that, I, I mean, so if, it, I'm just curious if these surveys come back um, and, and what, what do you do with the data, right? So, I really feel like it's it's the district office and the and the principals to be be really getting the finger on their pulses to what what's going on, 
and we should be getting reported back on it. But I, I don't know what you do with the data that says 90% are comfortable, right? That, what do we do as a board? We ask the administration to address it. So I would think you have faith in your administration, in my opinion, that that's what that's what's being done, and that's why we're getting we're asking them the questions, and they're getting that they're the persons that are interacting with the teachers. Um, and we've heard from some teachers that want to get back to live. I mean, we've read emails from teachers. I've talked to teachers that want to get back to full time live. They can't stand the way things are going. Uh, we have other ones that are very hesitant. I think we're trying to balance that as best as we can from a governance perspective. But we're not the operational guys we're trying to give some guidance and we're, and we're trying to steer the boat as best as we can with the information we have today. And, you know, in two years from now, we'll have hindsight on this and maybe say we got it right and maybe we'll say we got it wrong. Um, but that's my opinion. And I, I just want to add to that, that I speak to Dr. Horner on a very regular basis, and I have no doubt that he and our administration team is communicating with our teachers, asking them what they need, striving to do better, striving to support them. It's not perfect, but they definitely are communicating. Could we make it better? I have no doubt. We can always strive to be better. But th those conversations are happening. I'd like I mean, to make a couple comments, if I may, real quick. Um, please do. First of all, I'd like to thank the administration for the presentations earlier in this meeting and everybody that participated. Um, I didn't get a chance to comment earlier. That was awesome. Great information. Um, everyone's passion showed. So if everybody is still on, thank you. Um, secondly, I'd also like to thank um, the current board secretary, Anita Caseman. Um, Anita, you, you and I got to know each other well when I was president of the board. Um, you've done a wonderful job. Thank you so much for everything that you've done and the best of luck to you in your future ventures. And third, Keith Micucci, you look so funny with feline ears. <laughs> because when you talk, the Quaker Town logo is behind your head, and all we see are the cat's ears. <laughs> Maybe that's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I have missed your humor, Mr. Klein, and always lightening up the mood. <laughs> I Thank and I do. And I miss sitting next to you. I never thought I would say that. You, yeah, you, sure. and, you and John, I used to always give you guys a little nudge, you know? Uh -huh. um, yes. Anita, I just want to echo. I have to say, you know, I was, I was super both. It's sort of bitter, bittersweet, you know, sad that we're going to be losing you, but also so very excited <clears throat> that you're moving on and you're growing in your career. I know that's so exciting for you. Anita is one of the most organized people that I've ever met. And she also keeps me in line if I forget something, which I can't tell you how much I appreciate. Um, she will make sure that I get tasks completed. She's so thorough. She's done a phenomenal job for our district and we wish her so much of the best for the next steps in your career. We will miss you. Um, and we're sad, but we're so happy that, you know, you're, you're growing and, and we wish you all the best. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, pleasure serving you. Um, I'm sure I will leave you in great hands uh, with Terry and I will still be here on the uh, 12th of November for the meeting, but Terry will be running that, but I'll make sure that uh, she continues to keep you in line. <laughs> yes, I need it. I, I, I just want to say thank you as well. It was really been great working with you and I, uh, I hope you're leaving for a lot more money and not a lot less money. <laughs> I've been in Quaker Town 14 years. That would be the only way I would leave. So, congratulations. So come to me. We wish we'll you miss all the you best. terribly. Thank, Thank you, you Anita, for everything.
Anita also has three great, great kids, including a daughter who's also uber organized <laughs> and has kept my daughter in line through the years. <laughs> Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He Sorry. doesn't. Lauren right. is phenomenally organized. <laughs> Thanks again, Anita. You're welcome. Did we have any more public comment that came in? We have two or three. Yes, right, right now we actually have two. Okay. Right. Let's go ahead and um, read those. Okay, sure. Lisa Flommer from Richland Township. Um, is there an option for students with medical issues that want to go full time, but may need to go back to virtual? What is the bell schedule going to look like? How are you planning to make going back to school in tech if the timing is the same? And the last public comment is from Melissa Fox from Richland Township. Um, I'm not sure if this has been discussed in hearing that there are even more teachers may quit, take leave or retire when we go five days in person. Is it going to be crystal clear to us parents and our students if we are sending our children in only to sit in front of a sub for some of or all of their classes? I feel and I'm not alone if your teachers would have just agreed to use the cameras and live stream classes from the beginning, there wouldn't be as much of a push for five days in person. Uh, please live stream classes in real time. And that's the end of public comment. Thank you, Terry. Next is uh, dates for board member calendars. We have a facilities committee meeting on November 5th, November 12th, finance, education, and curriculum, as well as our next board meeting. December 3rd, we have a reorganization meeting, as well as a regular voting meeting. And December 10th, we have a policy committee meeting. And next on our agenda is a adjournment. So I'll just need a motion to adjourn so the meeting. <laughs> discussion. No discussion. Thank you all. Thank you all so much oh, for all your feedback and, and hanging in there with us. Those of you who are left. All in favor. All in favor. Uh, yeah. Can I vote? Aye. Can I vote? Aye. Wash your hands. Have a great week, everyone. Good night, Good night. all. Good night. <laughs> Thank you.